All right, hello everyone. We are back trying to talk about metamathematics and its relationship to our physics project. The surprising unification of, uh, in a sense, the dynamics of mathematics and the dynamics of the physical world. And this is, a, this is the notebook that Jonathan was using last time um, to talk about the, in a sense, just to summarize, and, and um, Jonathan should uh, interrupt me as appropriate, but um, uh, the basic idea is our multiway systems can be thought of, the rules, the underlying rules for the multiway system can be thought of as the, uh, just as they can be thought of as the operation of the rules of physics, they can also be uh, rules of mathematics. That is the application of mathematical um, uh, um, uh, axiom systems, and um, the so so in a sense this is so one interpretation. And again, we we need to get these a little bit straight. One interpretation here is that what we're thinking about is theorems show the equivalence between things. So for example, these might be two representations. Th these might be a representation of a word and a group. And this uh, uh, connection here might say, according to the axioms of the group or groups in general, that word is equivalent to this other word. And therefore there is a theorem that says this is equal to that. And then there is a progression of sort of what's equal to what that you get by following down these paths. And a that's kind of and, and then the idea is to encode a sort of a, a base axiom system as the underlying collection of connections here. And I, I had examples of this even in the NKS book of doing things like that. Then, new idea, the the notion is to think about foliations of this uh, graph as corresponding to models of the underlying system. So in other words, we here we're saying based on the underlying axioms, we can deduce that this, uh, this turns into this, that this is equal to this and so on. But now, if we add a model which essentially allows us to, which essentially coordinatizes this picture, this is sort of an arbitrary coordinate system we're using here, but that coordinatizes this picture, then we say that that coordinate system says that anything that's below something else in this picture is follows from or is equal to that. Now I'm I'm already a little confused here because as soon as we start thinking about, I think we had some foliation someplace somewhere here. Um, are we imagining in this picture where these things are terms, are we imagining that we're saying that any time you are essentially going down the orthogonal direction to the foliation, that is a, a, an, an equality relation? Is that, um, Jonathan or Xerxes, is that is that what we're saying here or, or not? Well, I mean, th th this this distinction is why I spent so long talking about, you know, clarifying the distinction between the groupoid structure and the topos structure, right? Where, where one is simply localizable and the other one has isomorphisms everywhere. So in the localizable case, it's possible to turn implications into equalities, but in the groupoid case, it's, you know, the, the, all the implications are already equalities. That's, you know, that, that's the clarification. Sorry, say that again, say that again. The, uh, for the groupoid case, I understand that what we've done is we've turned every one of these into a two-way uh, into a two-way thing, right? Right, right. So, so because, um, because the sort of fundamental structure that we're dealing with, which is the Rulio multiway system has a groupoid structure, you know, but by design, so to speak, um, and because every other structure can be viewed as being either a foliation or a fibration of that Rulio multiway system. They inherit not a full groupoid structure, but a topos structure in which it's not the case that every morphism is an isomorphism, but it's the case that, it, that the uh, topos can be localized. So you can, you can convert a subset of morphisms into isomorphisms. Okay, I'm not, okay. So, so when you say, so generally, these one-way arrows are thought of as like the morphisms of category theory. A two-way arrow is like an isomorphism. Yes, now, exactly. When you say, um, 
Okay, so let, let's just zoom out for a second. The, the Rulial limit, which I'm claiming is a little bit like some kind of a normalization group fixed point or something. The Rulial limit, let's just understand how that arises. The Rulial limit comes when you say for every one of these, instead of having this particular rule, I'm going to add all possible rules in this case, right? It, it's, you could think of it, could you think of it as some kind of completion limit or can yeah. you? No, that's exactly what it is, right? That's the, that's the point. It's, it's the, as each completion is applying a homotopy and the rule of your multi-way system is what you obtain in the limit as you add progressively higher order homotopies. Okay, let's walk through that for one second, okay? So each, each um, uh, uh, what we're saying here, a, homo a homotopy is to say, we're going to take that diamond and we're going to crush it. Right. That's saying that's what a completion would do. Am I right? Uh, yeah. For, so for, that would be a homotopy for paths of length two. Right. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, push X on our live stream is asking about this foliation. This is just a toy example. But what we're showing here is just a toy example. This is not a um, this is not the, the real thing is much wilder than this. Right. I, I have this some actual just... examples in my in my bulletin. Okay, should we should we look at them? Should we? Um, uh, yeah, if, if if you'd like, it's up to let's you. do it. Let's do it. Let's do it. Uh, sorry, let me share. Okay, let me know if anything is invisible. But um, so far okay, it's visible. so. Uh, yeah, okay, so this is the this is the thing I was saying about completion limits, right? So th this is an explicit homotopy between paths here. Right, which is which is representable as a critical pair completion between every pair of points here. Right. right. So, and, so and that okay, hold on. Let, let's just walk slowly through this. So this is saying we're taking we've got a completion which on its face would just complete a single branch pair to would would just remerge a single branch pair. But when we add that rule globally in, it produces this knitting, this this more global knitting of those paths. Uh, well, no, no, not quite. I mean, so, so what's happening is you're you're, you're inducing this this th this is a this is a sequence of critical pair completions you're inducing by defining this homotopy between these paths. Oh, I see. Then, I see. I'm sorry. So when 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 you add those in as completion rules, then you get this structure, which has that homotopy, but it also has other you know more global effects. Okay. 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 So I, I was wrong about the level. So I could have. Yeah. So yeah. What this I is said the thing was, you were talking was, about. Was right. What I, what you could have done instead of doing that homotopy between those paths that were of length whatever they were five or something up there, if you just done the length two homotopy, you would have um, gone. Uh, um, then you would have um, that you would have you would have still got a globally knitted thing down below, because by adding in that, by implementing that homotopy, you are as a completion you're having a global effect on the system. Yes, but it just it just wouldn't necessarily have knitted the entire paths of those it, it particular have, paths. It would have only right, it would, it would if, have if you had a single a diamond. Set. If you had just a one diamond. Then it would right. be. Then it would have knitted that diamond, but not necessarily a bigger diamond. Exactly. And and which pairs of points you consider to be related in this homotopy depends on your foliation, right? I mean, so in this case, we're foliating with respect to the initial cosmological rest frame here. So so we're you know th so this point is is associated to that point. This point's associated to that point. But if we picked a tipped foliation, it would be different, as I'll discuss later. And so th this is this is where the relationship between fibrations, homotopies, and foliations starts to become more explicit. Of, okay, or vibrations, so, foliations, homotopies, and completions becomes more explicit. Right. So I mean, the basic point here is you're saying we can actualize a foliation by saying not only do we say all those things in that layer we consider to be simultaneous or something, but let's actually make them. Uh, you know, make them identical by having a completion that brings them all that that connects them. Is that right? Right. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And I, as I, I have some, I have some examples of that later on. But okay, this is some kind of boring category theory stuff. Okay, this is the thing I was saying about. This. I mean, so if you have an object that's na that naturally has a groupoid structure, like a ruling or multi-way system does, then uh, when you construct vibrations of it, those vibrations inherit a topos structure. And that topos structure means that you can locally uh, turn morphisms into isomorphisms without changing the global structure of the system. 
Okay, I need to understand that better. By the way, we have a variety of questions on our live stream which indicate that we probably should just give a little bit more introduction because we dived deep into metamathematics or something. And uh, no, in, into a combination of what the heck is this a combination of? Type theory, metamathematics, physics, and something else. Uh, in do we? By the way, do we have Matthew on the on the? Um, uh, yes, we do. Uh, who hopefully is able to respond to some of these some of these questions. Um, uh, okay, I might be useful. Um, oh gosh, uh, this is a bunch of questions but i hope matthew can can respond to some of these questions because these are going to take us let, let's just do one more pass through what what the basic idea is okay so the basic idea is a mathematical theory is represented by a collection of replacement rules which are implementations of the axioms of the mathematical theory right so go go through to uh, wherever well there's, there's a nice example theory Right. So group theory, here it is represented as replacement. You know, here's like associativity represented as patterned replacement rules. Right. Okay. Right. So it's a multi-way system. Right. So, and, and that, and then the issue is um, in that multi-way system, and, and the picture you've got there is of a single proof. Um, right. And, uh, um, uh, there's a question about termination and live stream. Let's, for this single proof, what we're doing is we're saying find a path from this particular term to this other term to prove that they are equal, and that by definition is a is a uh, you know it's a it's a finite size thing. Well, assuming that assuming there is a finite path between those things. Okay, but what we're saying now is we're considering the meta mathematics of all possible proofs. And for that, and, and hopefully we, I don't know whether you made it yet, the thing that will actually stub a picture from the, uh, all po from the full multi-way system to put the stubs in that correspond to this picture here. Uh, no, I, uh, that wasn't relevant to what I was writing, but I can, I can do that. Well, right, but I mean, so the, the point is that the triangles represent things that are branching off into branchial space, basically. I mean, we, 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 did, we, did, we did discuss, I mean, we covered, hang on, how that works somewhere. Uh, not sure. Is it in this bulletin? Or is it in this post? You might want to enable dynamics so we don't see as many gray boxes. Um, right. Somewhere so, here, there, was, there was a discussion of that. Right. I mean, we, we got close. We didn't quite do it, though. Right. So this. What we wanted to do, there, that picture there, what we wanted to do was to make the stubs, because effectively what's happening is at every one of those branch, branch points there, what is happening, if I'm understanding correctly, is that in the full multi-way causal graph, there should be causal connections to other branches, right? Right, right. right. So, so each one of these critical pair diamonds is an indication of where this particular proof path is plumbed into a larger collection of proof paths in the overall multi-way system. Right. But I'd just like to see how that how that works, because I think that's going to well, be I mean, useful. I, I, mean, I, have some, I, I do have some examples. Like, like way later on, I do have some examples somewhere of how you, you, how you peel off individual proof paths from the multi-way system and how they correspond to the associated proof graphs and things. Um, it's, I don't know, it's kind of an obvious correspondence. Well, let me, let me see. It's a, so that's, a, that's the multi-way graph, multi-way causal graph. I mean, that's, a, that's an evolution states graph, a evolution causal graph, rather. Yes. Right? Okay, so now let's see how that peels off. So that there... So every causal edge becomes a dashed edge where you, you're using a particular construct and the proof of some future substitution lemma... Um, Every but evolution those, edge those, becomes but, a... Wait a minute. Those, those green things were Big Bang events, right? Those are initialization events. Those don't come from... Right? If, if you go back to your original picture, I mean... You're... No, no, the, but the, that's, that's not true. Okay. Well, where do the green things come from? The, they're, they're axioms. Well, so that's, they're, what, that's what these I replacement thought. rules. Yes. 
Yes, yes, yes. But okay, well, but I, the, I'm so those are big bang events. Big bang events are the, are the ones that are the initialization events that produce the initial. All right, state. I was I was thinking of those. All right, that I see your your point is what what you're doing there is your they are sort of big bang they're big bang rule events in the sense that those things are the rules that are going to be applied over and over again. But here we're indicating their provenance by showing you know, the green thingy, the green shield or something that then goes into, that then feeds into that, the, the, the feeds in saying that that edge, I mean, that is defining, that, that arrow there is saying that the dotted line above it, sorry, that green thing is really the identification for which rule was applied in the dotted line above, correct? Well, it's specifying which construct the rule came from. Yes, I understand. But the rule is the thing, the dotted line that joins one yellow well, yellow circle to the next yellow circle. Yeah. Right? But that rule, but this is a little different from what we're normally drawing, because normally in our normal multi-way graph, we do not draw the rules as, you know, the only thing we draw as rules coming from somewhere else are the causal edges that connect our events. So a, a more yeah, direct hence correspondence. Hence or, the orange things Exactly, here. exactly. But, my but that's point what the, is, that's what, that was what I was saying, right? So the, the solid lines are the evolution edges, the dashed lines are the causal edges. That was the point of these pictures. Okay, but why isn't there a solid line? Why is there no, it's a little odd that there are solid lines coming from the axioms. Why? Because I would have thought that the axiom would have a causal edge. The axiom is the thing from which the event comes. Or the other way around. The axiom is the thing to which you could apply an event from a substitution lemma. In the linear case like this, it doesn't matter which way around it is. I, I know it doesn't matter. I know it doesn't matter. But, but in, in a, but in, okay, but right. All right, fine. Right. But, I mean, do you have a more sophisticated example of this that isn't just linear? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, that, that was that's the point of doing this whole discussion over here. But I was, um, what I was going to talk about before that was, um, yes, so it's, it's the inheritance of the topos structure from the from the groupoid structure, right? That's I, you know. Okay, let me understand that. So, so the point is that as, as you apply, um, uh, um, as you ap apply the these completions, you apply the sort of full set of completions to implement, no, I'm sorry, we, we got off track here because what you were saying was given a particular foliation, you can in a sense actualize that foliation by adding completions that give you mappings between the equivalent states, made the states that are made equivalent by the foliation. Yeah. Is that correct? Right. So as you can see uh, here, for instance, right? The, the, you know, the, the, this is a pair of uh, pair of terms that are that are not related by the axioms, but one can add an additional relation, um, and then what what that corresponds to, if you then actualize it in terms of model theory, is a relation like this, which causes two branches to effectively behave as though they're one branch. Right? You're you're, you're taking two branches that would otherwise have been independent in the free object. And you're constraining them so that now I understand. But if you go back to your foliation picture, what is I mean, normally in a foliation, you're saying there is an equivalence. You're describing all things in a slice as being somehow equivalent. But here, what we're doing is we're saying things that go that follow from one slice from the next are equivalent. So I'm a little confused by that. Well, there are two equivalence relations. That's the whole point, right? There's, an, there's the equivalence relation of mutual independence from the axioms, and there's the equivalence relation of the actual part, uh, the actual total order induced by the model. Okay, fine. All right. So, so the equivalence right. there's, relation. There's an equivalence relation, just like in space time. There's an equivalence relation of space-like separation, right? There, you know, there's the equivalence relation of simultaneity, but there's also a well, there's a there's a unidirectional relation defined by time-like ordering. That's all we're saying. Okay, but so so here, let me just understand because here the time-like order is a deduction, but you are making you're you're turning that into an isomorphism 
somehow that can go both ways. Is that true or not? Uh, yeah, eventually. But I mean, for the time being, if, if, if that's um, seeing as that we didn't get, um, we still didn't really discuss the, the groupoid inheritance thing. If, if for the time being, we can just treat it as a morphism. It doesn't matter. Okay. But you're saying the completions actualize those morphisms, basically. Right. That given a particular foliation, you have a bunch of new morphisms induced by the foliation, so to speak, which you can then actualize as completions. Right, right. And that's ultimately yeah. the statement of the univalence axiom as interpreted in our models, right? It's the statement of equivalence between foliations, vibrations, and completions. Um, say that again, say that again, say that again. I missed something there. So... Conditions are equivalent. Um, you might want to hit the save button. Yeah. Um, okay. So let me understand that. So let's go through this. Okay. So a foliation is a foliation of the the sort of the raw the raw symbolic mathematics multiway graph that's what you mean by that right that's the kind of thing we're doing here a, i mean i mean inducing a total order on the partial order induced by proof theory okay fine okay the vibration you're talking about now is a vibration from the limit point groupoid infinity groupoid is that right well, it could be any fiber. It could be a, you know, a vibration of any structure. Well, explain the vibration in this context here. So I think I understand. Yeah, I mean, that, that's what I was doing, right? So, so th th this object has multiple branches. You know, th this is a free object that has multiple branches. Yep. Uh, if we wanted to, we could vibrate it so we could only consider a subset of those branches. Yes. Right? As as an individual fiber, just like in the you know in the Rulial case we we talked about uh, sort of two two sessions ago, and the point is, one way you can do that is by defining an equivalence relation between those branches, which is a completion, and the choice of which completion you make is determined by your vibration, and the fact that you can uh, that there is effectively an equivalence between um, defining a homotopy between paths and defining an identity relation between elements is what the univalence axiom says. So, so the, 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 the fact that this is a vibration, that this can be induced by completion rules, and that uh, this, you know, the, the set of completion rules that you use is determined by your foliation is what the univalence axiom ultimately means in these formalisms. So let me understand that again more carefully. So let's, let's, let's understand how that corresponds to the computational boundedness of observers or not. Because that's basically saying, what, you, what you're saying is this conflation, so in space-time, for example, there isn't a conflation of things in different places in space in the same sense. Right? There might be in quantum mechanics, but there isn't in space-time. Right, right, because in space-time you're not dealing with multi-way systems. Well, I understand. Your individual experience is not a multi-way system. Right. So you, you could have a, the, I mean, okay, this is a sort of alien intelligences type discussion, right? You, you, you could have an, a, an alien intelligence that perceived space-time in the same way we perceive quantum mechanics, where they were effectively looking at elementary bifurcations in the, yeah. the space-time causal network and defining equivalences between those. And they would have a very different view of physics. Right. So their view of physics would have no space. Right. In the first approximation. It would just it, be... Well, it, it, except that they, in the same way as we see weird things that are the consequence of branchial geometry, exactly. they would see weird things that are, con that are consequence of spatial structure. Let's so just walk through that for directly. one second a little bit. Let's just walk through that for a second. So imagine that we were, take the other case in which we were laid out in branchial space and able to consciously observe different parts of branchial space, which we're not currently. We have, you know, we are, so imagine that you know, you're describing an intelligence where basically its experience of space is like our experience of branchial space. It's a single threaded experience. And so what weird effects would you see? Well, the weird effects you would see are mostly because you would say, well, 
well, actually, it's a superposition of all these states because, but which uh, it's actually very analogous, isn't it? I mean, it, it it's the statement. Yeah. The the um. So, in a sense, we are. So we happen to exist in a single thread of branchial space and multi-threaded in physical space. And if we were single threaded in physical space, it would be there would be all these effects that come because we would say, gosh, look, there are these things that are coming. You know, we, we're trying to complete everything down so that it so that we only need to consider essentially our generational states in space. this okay what is the claim here that that's so if, if you had an if you had observers who were capable who were localized in um or who, who were forced to collapse space-like separations down in space time but could move freely in branchial space that analog of causal invariance would be multi-way invariance in which you could take multiple for each of the possible time-like paths through the causal network. There is an isomorphic multi-way system that you would observe. Yes. And so, well, therefore, not, not so, quite, which, which, yeah. which would justify so you know implies justification for collapsing space-time. Ah, sorry, down to a single time-like path. Okay, so let's understand why it is. Could we imagine, you know, we sort of have only one path that we are conscious of in branchial space. Is that obvious it has to be that way? In other words, imagine that we had, you know, our quantum AI, so to speak, this is a good, this is going to make a good science fiction plot of nothing else. Um, you know, the quantum AI that maintains multiple threads of consciousness in branchial space. Right. Just as we can say, you know, somebody could say, what do you mean? You have, you know, somebody could say, you have completely different civilizations and different star systems. That's outrageous. Why aren't they just all, you know, how can you perceive that there are two different civilizations and two different star systems? All we perceive is that there's a, a certain thread of time. Um, but what would it mean? Um, uh, let's think. So no invariant Causal partial order. Well, that's well, that's a yet different thing, right? That's an even right. higher level. But I mean, no. Look, this is the whole point. This is the whole point. The thing that allows us to get reducibility, the thing that allows us to make sense of the world or of mathematics, is the fact that we are modding out by all of that. How did you get from here to there? If you don't do I, that, I don't, I don't disagree. But what, so why why is this a why is this the strongest? It's the same statement. Same statement as what? As what you were just discussing. I mean, definite things happening. In, you mean in either, either there's an invariant causal partial order across all branches of the multiway system, or there isn't. If there is, then all branches of the multiway system can be treated as observationally equivalent. And if then if there's not, then they can't. Well, you're saying. I see. Your your point is. Now I'm very confused because. Your point is that there isn't a symmetry here between the the causal invariance is operating in the multiway space and not in physical space, which makes there be a different. It isn't the case. No, no, no it's not. It's not different because you could define multiway invariance, which operates in space time, right? Where the induced multiway systems for each time like path are isomorphic. That was my whole point. And so, what I'm trying to say is that an AI who sees multiple branches of the multiway system that are, that are not observationally equivalent by definition cannot uh, construct a causal invariant representation of the world. Right? That's what it means for those branches to be inequivalent. Just walk through this one more time. 
So what we're saying, but, is, like I said, so so either each branch of the multi-way system yields an isomorphic causal network, an iso, you know, an, invari- an isomorphic causal partial order relation, or yeah. it doesn't. So if it does, then you have causal invariance. There is only right. one branch of the multi-way system up to isomorphism, and that's yep. to, to the best of our knowledge, that's that's basically that's objective reality. What we that's, have, right? So right. what you're claiming is one where there isn't. Um, where, where you have an AI which can, can which can simultaneously perceive multiple inequivalent branches of the multiway system, which by definition therefore means that they can't have an, inv- an invariant causal partial order. All right. Okay. Okay. So your point is so they must be the capable case, of tracking rather, multiple possible causal histories at the same time. No, but, but, but your, your point is if, if the underlying rules of physics are causal invariant, then there's no possibility of a multi-threaded quantum AI. That's part of my point. Yeah. Right, but so, so that point is, but nevertheless, the analog of that, there is a multi-threaded physical space AI. That's okay, because there is no similar, you know, notion of, of causal invariance for space. That's a feature of branchial space, but not a feature of space. Did that make sense? Uh, not to me. Okay, explain. I mean, so... Go on, sorry. No, I mean, so the point is, I'm trying to understand in what sense the, look, the multiway graph is formed in you know the extent of the multiway graph it it extends in branchial space yeah obviously and if there is causal invariance there is a you know a single as you say there is a single essentially you know up to ice you know there's a, there's a single objective history to the multiway to to what happens in the multiway system but if you look at the corresponding thing in space-time, yeah, then you get multiway invariance, which is this. Well, you're, you're saying if you said, I'm confused. Let, let's. let's no, no, what I'm saying is really, really simple, right? So, so each in the multiway evolution in the evolution causal graph, there are multiple causal networks, multiple space-times. You know, one for each branch. Within each space-time, there are multiple time-like paths, right? The swapping the space, the spatial and branchial directions yields the, the, the analog of causal invariance, which would be multi-way invariance, which says, if you look at, for each time-like path, what is the associated causal network for that time-like path? What, sorry, what is the associated multi-way graph for that time-like path? You could ask, are those multi-way graphs necessarily isomorphic as directly sure. cyclic graphs. Yes. I in understand. other words, is, is the branchial structure the same? And that's the direct analog of multi of causal invariance for the multiway system. So yeah. the, the, the symmetric idea. Okay, so, so your point is, if you look at the causal graph in space time, each causal, each path through that causal graph has a... Uh, there are multiple copies of that path, right? That right. exist extended in, in, in the branchial In the different space. parts of the multiway So you can, you can look at the induced multiway graphs for each... Uh, I understand you know, for, for each such time-like path. But I think it's not quite, there's a slight difference here. Okay, so let's just go through this. So this is, saying, this is saying, if you are looking at, um, if you live in space-time, then right now, if you look at a particular branch, I mean, the, the full thing is the multi-way causal graph, where you can look at it, project it onto space-time so that you're going down you know, so you're looking at the the causal graph projected onto a particular causal graph associated with a particular multi-way slice, so to speak, of space-time. Now, what you're saying is you can project the multi-way causal graph in in one of two directions. You can either say that you're going to look at these, you know, you're going to take as, you know, I mean, yes, I I right, I think this is what you're saying. You can yeah. project it either way around. You can either say you've got a, um, and, and either way around, the other direction in it looks like something that has a, um, uh, for which you can ask the question, is there a, um, 
you know, what does causal invariance mean? And does causal invariance mean but there's it's not causal good. invariance in this case? It's, it's multi, it's evolution, you know, multi-way evolution graph invariance. Which might not be true. Just like causal invariance might not be true, right? But the, the whole point is you're taking this multi-way causal network. You can mod out by one of two possible directions. And then you can ask whether the other yep, exactly. uh, combinatorial structures re retain isomorphism. Exactly. Yes. Yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. I okay, so I don't the, see why there's why there's an asymmetry. Well, in our way of describing, no, no that if, if you say you're looking, the main thing is the multi-way causal graph, you can project it either in a spatial direction or a branch hill direction. I agree. Okay, cool. Yeah, that's, that's all I was saying. But, but, but I mean, but we have made more claims about causal invariance than about multi-way invariance. We don't think... I think that multi-way invariance is true, whereas we think it is plausible that causal invariance is true. And what you're saying is, even if, you know, you, you have made the claim that even if causal invariance isn't true, we'll make it true by doing completions as a result of the way we observe things. And you're saying, just like if we were, so I'm just trying to walk through what it means, because we have a better understanding of spatial, you know, a physical space than a branchial space. If we were this, these organisms that were essentially doing spatial completions, right? What would that look like? What would that be doing? What that would be saying is, it would be like what we do in statistical mechanics, like the coarse graining we do in statistical mechanics. We'd be saying we're coarse graining across these spatial directions. Right, right, right. And it would be way, it, it would be one, it would be the alternative way of measuring, say, um, you know, two, two halves of a bell pair or something. Yes. Okay. Fair enough. But I mean, we're, what we'd be doing is, you know, what would actually be, be seen to happen is we'd be saying we are, um, uh, we're combining. So if there's causal invariance, right, then, okay, if there was both multi-way invariance and causal invariance, then we have turned the universe into... I would say an ODE or something. I mean, we've turned it into something where there's just a single thread of time and that's all there is. It's not just a single thread of time. There's, there's one time-like path. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's what I mean. There's, there's one, there's no space, there's no branch hill space. It's right. just, it's a, you know, we've turned it from what would you could think of as a big sort of PDE-like creature to something which is just a single variable, you know, evolving in time. Mm -hmm. Okay? So, so it, probably isn't so multi-way invariance probably isn't true and the argument is whether branchial you know causal invariance is true and we don't know and it, and it probably doesn't matter much no, no, but, the, but the point i'm making is that just as we can induce causal invariance we can and do induce multi-way invariance when doing things like teleportation um well so i, I mean I, if, if we could do genuine teleportation consider an epr pair right so um yeah if they are spatially separated and we want to produce a quantum measurement of the, uh, we want to, well, we want, we want to measure the combined quantum state of that system. I understand. Then, then we have we to implicitly do a, a perform spatial, a, a spatial, completion. spatial completion. I agree. Inducing, uh, I just don't have a, as much in, intuition about, about that as I might have about coarse gradient statistical mechanics. Um, all right, but anyway, so so where, how on earth did we get into this discussion? We were talking about um, how did we get into this? We were oh, we were talking about the significance of the univalence axiom for physics. So we're saying here that you're saying, given the underlying multiway system, right? The claim is that a foliation which defines a total order um, a vibration which goes in that case what is the definition of a vibration when it hasn't when it doesn't come okay wh why is the univalence axiom why why <sighs> So I, I, I don't understand the question. Well, uh, there isn't a well-formed question. Um, right. I mean, the univalence axiom is the thing that allows you to treat these paths as being a single path and therefore allows... So, for, you know, for, for this four-branched thing, this four-branched algebraic structure, 
that happens to be a finite group. Um, there exists uh, there exists a foliation of this four branched structure into three branched fibers. Right. Okay. I mean, it's not, not self evidently obvious to me, but, but I mean, yes, I'm sure there is. You, you can just, you can just have a bunch of relations that you, but that combine branches. Well, yeah. I mean, that, that, that's kind of the point, right? It's hang wait. Uh, what is the old thing? Yeah. Cause so like, you know, in the, in the case of a really old multi-way system, right. So we have, there exists a vibration into sort of multi-branched, sorry, this is a large and dynamic notebook. Pass enable dynamics, it'll help you a lot. It, that tends to make things slower. Oh, uh, well, I don't know. Oh, maybe it doesn't. <laughs> Okay, what was I? Yes, okay, so there exists, you know, there exists many, there exists a vibration of this really old multi-way system into multiple, I guess in this case, it's seven branched uh, ordinary multi-way systems. How do you know right? it's seven? Where did, where did the seven come from? Because I explicitly constructed it, I think to be seven, wait. If oh, I... Okay, okay, I saw a seven in there, but I don't know why it's seven branches. Something like this. Okay. Um, and so, so all I'm making is the, is the analogous claim here, right? So there exists wait, a wait, vibration wait, 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 into it. Slow, slow down a second. So we've got this really old graph, and we're saying, by what did you do to get that particular vibration? Well, so in this case, I'm, I'm just cheating, right? I, I, I'm starting from the, uh, from the particular multi-way system I want, and then I'm highlighting that. Okay, fine. fine. The point is, what would, I, what would I have to do in order to construct this explicitly? Well, all the, the only point I'm making is, we could just take all the branches that aren't on this fiber and make them equivalent to branches that are on this fiber, right? So in other words, you're saying you could collapse this real, this graph to its one fiber by either slight, by either doing completions that just collapse everything onto that fiber or by doing foliations, which define equivalence classes that, uh, make everything orthogonal to that fiber slide down onto that fiber. Is well, that my point saying? is that they're the same, right? That was, that's the whole context for this. No, I understand that. The claim is that those, are, those can all be viewed as being the same. Now, right. but they are, in these finite systems, they are literally symbolically the same, are they not? Yeah, right. But, so, but the point is you, you have to make one additional assumption to be able to, to be able to, the point is, What's the difference between calling this a single branch and calling this two branches, but where you can kind of hop from one to the other? That okay. involves making a statement that identity and equivalence are the same thing. That the fact that there is equivalence between AB and BA here on these two different branches means that we can treat the branches as identical is the statement of univalence. And does that statement have more teeth if the thing goes, gets infinite somehow? Well, it's, yeah, I mean, it kind of, it, it's, it's only, yeah, it's only non-obvious when you have a continuum system. It's not, it's not about infinite. It's about, it's about, it's about, you know, uncountability. Right, because in this case, the treat them as identical is kind of like, well, sure, you can do that. But explain what, what would go wrong. What's the obstruction when you try and, you know, what makes it non-obvious that you can treat them as identical when it's a continuous system? Well, it's not, it's not obvious even in the discrete case, right? That's why you need an axiom of, of propositional extensionality. What would you mean? Notion, I mean? Go ahead. The notion that propositional extensionality should extend to systems which are not obviously propositional, like you know, continuous topological spaces, that's where it, that's where it gets non-trivial. What do you mean propositional extensionality? You mean like the axiom of extensionality in set theory or what? Uh, well, the axiom of, it's the axiom of extensionality is an example of extensionality. The proposition. So, what is the general meaning of extensionality? Well, extensionality just means when do you consider two things to be the same, right? So the axiom of extensionality in set theory says you consider sets to be the same when they have the same elements. Propositional extensionality says that you consider propositions to be the same when one implies the other, when, when, when they mutually imply each other. Sorry, that A and B are, are you know. Could Identical you make a note of that because I, I need to remember that. Okay. Um, so, so uh, I, I think I already made a note about this, but I can make another one. So, state equivalence function in general, you know, mathematics. Right. Um, so, you know, axiom of extensionality is an example of that for sets. Consider 
two sets equivalent if they contain the same elements. All right. Propositional extensionality. All right. So, so. All right. What we had been talking about last time, and I know you want to talk about top offices and things like that, and we're going to get to those. But what we've been talking about last time is choices of foliations that correspond to, I mean, the, the, essentially the tipped foliations and the idea that you could define a tipped foliation by just adding one relation, for example. Right. Right, so do, do you have an example of that now? Well, so, I mean, that, that, that was this, right? Okay, but, but how about we can see that, can we see that in a group? Yeah, I mean, this is a group. Okay, okay, and so then you add, so there's a group, and let's just walk through for a second, both for my benefit and for people on the live stream. Let's just, could you scroll up, just show what the relations are that lead to this thing? Well, I mean, we can, we can reconstruct it if you like. So we take multi-way group uh, generators, a, B, uh, relations that start with, strings yet. They're, they're, like I said in my email, they're, they're all converted to strings internally. Yeah, I understand that. I just worry about their trip in, in, into the interior. Oh, in, in transit. No, it should be fine. I, I, yeah. Famous last words. I think it's going to, I think there are letters <laughs> that you could use which would not be fine, which would just blow up completely. But anyway. Um, um, oh, well, well I, I, that'll be fun to see. Okay. okay, by the way, Nick points out on a live stream that we should update the glossary with all these metamathematical terms, and he's right. Um, I'll send them in to be added. Okay. So here's... What the heck is that? It's a multi-way system. Okay, so show it in the non-layered form first before you confuse us totally. Okay, sorry. Um, okay. So this thing here is, let's just understand this. This is a free group. Yep. Okay, so why isn't this, let's understand what this picture is, which so th is this not is, this my is one favorite. Of things I'm, yeah. This is one of the things I'm really excited about because like this is a new kind of object. It's a, it's a Cayley graph, but with additional proof theoretic structure, which I think is really cool. Yes, I mean, I, I I hate to tell you this, but I'm pretty sure these existed in NKS. I mean, I I talked about this this exact thing, and I, I had a whole elaborate discussion of why these aren't Cayley graphs. Mm -hmm. Right, um, I, I saw. But right. as far as I could tell, you 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 did it for groups. I couldn't see any other algebraic structures. Uh, uh you mean like what, like loops or something? I mean, so I, w what I've been doing is I've been gradually just translating all all algebraic structures I could think of into these I things. did it for groups and semi-groups. I didn't even do it for monoids, yes. Okay, there are monoids, there are abelian groups. I, I'm, I'm working on rings and things. Oh, cool. No, that is interesting. That's definitely interesting. But but I just want to understand this picture for a second, mm -hmm. okay? So could, could we just look at a smaller version with labels? Uh, yeah. Or, or the two version, even the two version with labels. I, I mean, let's let's do... Why not? Let's do the free group on one generator. <laughs> okay. Okay, so these are the words in the free group on one generator. Right, right? except that some of these words are equivalent. Exactly. So, so in the Cayley like graph, e, they would e be collapsed. E, e, e. Exactly so. Right, yep. this is the, yes, this is, yes, this is a structure that I also have long believed should exist, right? <laughs> and whenever I've tried to feed this to mathematicians, they just tell me to go look at the Cayley graph, which is this thing with all its pieces collapsed. Exactly, it's a Cayley graph with a state equivalence function defined by uh, the... Right, so um, this is the unrolled, issues. you know, this is the unrolled structure of the group, the group before it has been modded down by the by the equivalence relation, right? right? You know, before the word problem has been solved. This is the un, this is the the thing without its word problem solved. But the, I mean, but you can still infer the solution. I mean, okay, I was I'm, pre I'm preaching to the converted here, but you can obviously you, you can see the solution to the word problem by computing parts. I know by parts, parts. I which, know which you can't do in a Cayley graph. Which I think yes, I'm well aware. Awesome. Right, right. No, I agree. I, I'm a big fan of this structure. <laughs> okay, so let, let's. Okay, well, we finally get to after all these years, we get to actually analyze this this kind of structure. Okay, right. But but um, uh, but I think the important observation, which which really I had not understood at all was this idea of um, uh, of models 
corresponding to uh, foliations of the structure. That that's a really interesting idea. Um, but but anyway, so you're okay. So I agree. That is that is essentially the actualization of the word problem. What you just showed. Right. And and for example, by the way, in the NKS book, you will find the um, uh, a a, um, uh, a group with an undecidable word problem. Right. I think it's a, maybe it's a semi group with an undecidable word problem. And you can make this picture with that. And what does right. it mean to have an undecidable word problem? It means that there are arbitrarily long paths that you have to follow that, that exist in this in this thing. Right. Because the undecidable of the word problem is that you can't, um, you know, that you have to. Uh, um, that was a mistake. That was a big mistake. <laughs> I would suggest you interrupt it. I think that's I, I, I did. <laughs> oh, oh, well, there you go. Okay, that's cool. It's a bit of a shame that it doesn't look more symmetrical. I mean, it's fairly symmetrical, but I'm sure the real structure is, is actually uh, still more symmetrical. Okay, fine. Uh, so, okay. So the thing I wanted to point out was, so, um, now let's take this and we could say highlight graph, I don't know, <clears throat> um, multi-way graph, A, B, B, A. So that's there and there. Nice. Okay. So now if we do the abelianization. Yeah. Right. So if we lay this thing out, oh, it's a partial abelianization. So if we lay this thing out in space time, branch time. So what we want to do is we want to construct now a foliation effectively where um, let's construct the foliation where uh, so a, 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 B and B, A are not treated as equivalent with respect to this partial order, right? Yeah. But the, where you can define a foliation in which they are and we can simulate that by taking this thing and then adding, oops, sorry. Accidentally brought up documentation. Well, what I would suggest doing, the heck is that? Oh, that's what happened. Um, when you click frame apparently, uh, and we do relations a equal uh, a b equals b a. Then we get that. Mm -hmm. So, th so this is this is the point, right? So that that foliation, which would be a flat, that would be an inertial foliation because it's just one. Uh, equivalence, which is then applied everywhere, uh, defines this vibration of the system in which we treat these paths as you know, okay, we effectively define them more explicitly. Let's let's go back and let's look at the full foliation, which means not just one, not just two things got to be identical, but we slice everything with that sort of slicing. Okay, so in this in this example here, where would we put the foliation slices? I mean, there's many different ways, we, places we can put them, but what's the minimal set of places to put the foliation slices to get this inertial foliation? Well, we just need we we need a we need slices where, um, you know, where where, where I one of these. I suggest that you say aspect ratio to a half for that layered graph plot. Sure. Okay, I think that's more revealing, but only adjust. Okay, so now, <laughs> now. Okay, where do you think the foliation goes here? Well, so you, you any, anything where there where these lie on different hypersurfaces would be a would be a, a you know, valid such foliation. Well, where where those lie, okay. So this is the claim. This is morphism versus isomorphism. There's a little bit of a story there that it doesn't. That you're just saying that those lie that those are not even though in this picture those appear in the same vertical slice, right? Right. You're saying they're no that, longer mutually independent. Right. But what, what you're saying is we need some routing of the foliation slices so that those two things appear in different slices. Right. And your claim is that is the only constraint. Other than that, we can do whatever we want. Right. Right. And so the point is if we proper, if, if we let that just be a general inertial frame, then so we, we know from these completion rules that if we just define rules that say, you know, AB goes to BA, BA goes to AB, which is effectively what these relations are doing, it's not just going to affect that pair of states, right? It's obviously going to affect any pair of states that has an AB or a BA subterm. Yeah. 
So this foliation effectively gets extrapolated out to the whole rest of the Milky Way system. Well, but let's so, see how that works. Can we do that? Or how but, would I mean, we do what, that? How would we draw doing. that foliation? Uh, I, let me actually get the code for this. Oh, this is where aspect ratios come back to bite us. <laughs> what the heck? There we go. That's <laughs> that's almost right. Well, so you're saying that, but I don't know why this is a canonical such foliation at all. What, what, what do you mean? Well, I mean, why is this, what is canonical about this foliation? As what, in, do mean, what do you mean by canonical? Well, I mean, you're saying it's an inertial frame, but yeah. you're saying, and the reason you say it's an inertial frame is because it, there is a cosmological inertial frame, which corresponds to the thing that is a certain number of, of um, a certain graph distance from the root, right? Sure. Well, uh, where, but, uh, the, well, the actual point I'm making is that this is this is how I define an inertial frame, right? So that that. Um, where do I say this? Right. Yeah. Free flat or inertial reference zones corresponding to what we might call free models. Models when viewed as an algebraic structure, they're those defined by the axioms, um, or by one additional relation. Right. So, so if you just define, if you if you just have the the um, foliation defined by the axioms, that's the inertial frame. The, the, that's the that's the cosmological rest frame. Then, if you have one additional relation, that defines an inertial frame. Is that a nice? I mean, does that work in in space time? Just having a single beta parameter is that is that sufficient to define the notion of an inertial frame? Pretty much, right? Are you sure? I mean, let's think about that. But you're saying. That, I mean, there are other one I, parameter families that aren't inertial at all in space time. Um, not one parameter families of, you know, effectively angles of normal vectors in geodesic normal coordinates, which is all. all yeah, I really understand what about. that is, but is that what this is as well? Oh, that's what I'm defining it to be. <laughs> it's, um, we, I mean, obviously, this space doesn't have a geometry defined on it so we, we're free to do what we like so in some at some level right um so i mean i can make a note of that so uh let's define cosmological rest frame as being um the free model define Somebody is commenting that wasn't it proved that there isn't a cosmological rest frame by the Michelson Morley experiment? No, sorry, that was uh, that was before the cosmic microwave background was discovered. It was the the concept that there wasn't an ether that you didn't the concept that you needed an ether for electromagnetic wave propagation was disproved. The concept that there is a rest frame for the universe was absolutely not disproved, although at the time nobody knew that, that was the case. But in modern times, we know from the rest frame of the cosmic microwave background that there is a, um, uh, a rest frame for the universe. And we are traveling at about one one thousandth of the speed of light relative to that rest frame. Um, Does that seem reasonable? That I mean, obviously, you know, in space sorry, time, was, you just need, you just need one. You, Michael and so you just right. need one additional equivalence between space-like separated events to define a global inertial frame. So, in the same way, we define a, a you know an inertial model as being one where there's one additional relation beyond the the sort of background partial order induced by the axioms. 
it's not 100% obvious to me that, that this thing about one additional equivalence relation between space-like separated events is sufficient to force the frame to be inertial. It's not obvious to me. I think that requires some kind of proof by using, by actually thinking about, um, oh gosh, it might, should, maybe should be obvious. Well, um, I mean, the, the, is it, isn't the proof just, you know, a pair of space-like separated events defines an angle of a, you know, of a time-like vector in geodesic normal coordinates, that angle defines a global inertial frame by definition. Well, but, but you've got to prove that it doesn't have acceleration. What? Look, an inertial frame doesn't have acceleration. I, right? I, I know. I know what an inertial frame is. So, but that... What, what... Why is it self-evident that the thing you've defined cannot define, cannot... Uh, must force a metric that doesn't involve acceleration. It doesn't, obviously. What doesn't? It doesn't force it. Of course, a, a single pair of space like separated events does not force a metric that's non-accelerating, but okay. it does completely define an iner a global inertial frame. You, you're saying there exists an inertial frame Consistent with for, for the, every pair, yeah, that there is a unique and inert, global inertial frame I, I, defined that I by agree a pair with. of space right. That I events. agree with, but it's not sufficient to say that yes, that is correct. But it's no, not of obvious. But the, the, just like adding one additional group relation is not sufficient for proving that there are that there is only one additional group relation. Indeed, but the thing you get out by just adding one additional group relation and just, I mean, that's what I'm complaining about with, with your straight foliation lines, that that's in no way a unique foliation consistent with the constraint that it should put those two values, you know, A, B, and B, A in different slices. But what, yeah, but that, that, that's the beauty of it, right? So if you only add one additional relation, so you have, so if you only have one, if there's only one, um, equivalence made between space like separated events then that gives you a you know th th then the that that the only thing that that you can uniquely define is a global inertial frame if you have space like if you have two equivalences between two different pairs of space like separated events then you start to get into the realm of accelerating frames and, and curvature and things like that no but there are many different slicings that are consistent with the total order that you're defining here right uh, yeah, that's yeah, right. Right, but I mean, and this is just one one such frame as the one you're drawing. But it is not obvious to me that that frame, as you have drawn it, does not have weird accelerating features. I, I mean, I'm to I'm totally confused. Okay, so the, we are the the only type of frame that is uniquely specified by an equivalence relation between a pair of space like separated events is a global inertial frame are we in agreement about that the only one that is uniquely specified that has no other that uh, yes but i'm not, i'm but 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 many but the constraint that you're giving here is compatible with many non inertial frames yeah the only frame that is fully specified by this is an inertial frame yeah so ju okay. just like, as I say, the, the constraint that there is this additional relation is compatible with many other possible finite sets of relations that don't contain a single element. Yeah. So sure. what's, the, what's, the, what's the problem? You're making the claim that this is, that you can immediately deduce from, look, what I'm complaining about is the drawing of these slices which I claim is non-unique and not obviously consistent with it being not obviously being the, the fact that you can identify those two points and say these define an inertial frame, no problem. The fact that these slices that you've defined, which, which entail lots of other relationships, are the inertial frame associated with those things is not obvious to me. But that, I mean, that's what I'm defining it to be. And, I'm, I, and like I say, because of this, it's, it's exactly consistent with the definition of an inertial frame in relativity. I'm confused as to why it wouldn't be. I have to think about it some more. I'm not, I'm not, you might be right that it's sufficient to define it as that. Um, I mean, I agree, of course, this, you know, these foliation lines are a complete fake, right? Because this, this network is not laid out in, in the appropriate way, but that's not the point. Right? The, the... Okay. I don't think we, we let, okay. But, but the main issue here is what we're saying is 
there exists a foliation which uh, records these new relations that have been added. And you're saying, and, and we think of that as, okay, so what is the relationship between a model? You're saying, as we add more relations, we are homing in more precisely on I mean, a model, to, to make a model, we could just say we are coordinatizing the space, putting these terms at these coordinate positions. And when, you know, one term appears on top of another term, it means that there's a, you know, there's an equivalence between these things. That will be a sort of a fully specified model. You are edging towards models by adding relations. Right? Um, well, these aren't that we're edging towards a, a complete, a maximally non-free model by adding relations, if that's what you mean. Yes, that's what I mean. But even the free group is a model of the group axioms. Fair enough. Okay, fair enough. It's just, but, like I say, it's, it's defined to be a model which satisfies no additional relations beyond the axioms of a group. Fine. Okay, fine. So, but what I'm saying is that in normally, in, you know, you can, you know, when you go far enough, so, so actually something I don't know, it's probably obvious. You know, you take a group, icosahedral group, whatever you want, A5, whatever it is, right? And it has a certain set of generators and relations. Let's say you incompletely add the relations. What do you get? A different you group. Get, what's that? A different group. Closer to the free group. I see, I see, I see. But it might not be a finite group. That's the point. That's, that's why we don't so much know about it. The point is you need a certain set of relations to guarantee finiteness. And probably by the time you've hit finiteness, uh, even, even then, you might go further. Okay, so fine. So what will happen is you start with a free group. You keep adding relations. The thing will, at some moment, it will become a finite group. Um, right. which, and, and the, yeah, sorry, go, go ahead. No, Can so you I, show I, that I, actually here? Well, no, I, I was just going to say, and obviously we, we, have the, we have the model of the free group, and we also have the model of the maximally non-free group. Well, in fact, I actually have a picture here uh, somewhere. It takes a moment to render because it's quite a complicated object. But basically, you, you know, you take some algebraic structure, you apply all possible Knuth-Bennix completion rules to it, and therefore you get the maximally non-free version of that algebraic structure because it's now that structure. It's the free version of that structure in which all possible relations have been applied. And how does that relate to the Rulio graph? Well, that, yeah, that, that's the point, right? So the, the Rulio graph is the maximally non-free object. That's why we consider it to be the fundamental structure. So this is an example of a group to which every possible relation has been applied. So it's the maximally non-free group. Right. But now that object, if we looked at the Cayley graph of that object, it would just crush down to one point. Am I right? Right, right. Everything is equivalent to identity. Ultimately. Right. So, so all the, the life and times of this thing is in the non-manifest equivalence of different words. Right, right. So the, the you know obviously the, the fundamental point. I mean, it's kind of obvious, but we should probably note it anyway. You know, the free group is maximally quantum mechanical or purely quantum mechanical. The maximally non-free group, i.e., in which all possible relations slash completion rules. Is purely classical. All normal. No, normal is about all. Uh, I can't say regular. Ordinary groups um, lie somewhere on the quantum classical spectrum. Yes. Um. So this Rulial structure is basically the Rulial structure of an arbitrary binary operator with arbitrary binary operator with inverses and so on. In other words, yes. What else does it have? That Rulial structure has the underlying group axioms. But, but, here's, but, but I mean, here's the interesting thing, right? So, the, so in this, 
again, preaching to the converted, I know. But the nice thing about these objects is that ultimately they don't make a distinction between the group axioms and the relations, just like, know. You know, because multi-way systems don't make a distinction. In fact, they don't make a distinction with the generators either. The generators are just unidirectional relations. And so the point is, um, it doesn't, ultimately, once you get to this structure, just like it doesn't, you know, once you've generated the rule your multi-way system for some model of computation, it kind of doesn't matter what the underlying model of computation was. By the time you've generated this thing, it doesn't matter what the underlying axioms were. The point is every algebraic structure that can be defined as... I understand, has a limit point, which is this. Uh, right. you know, it's well, a limit well, point under repeated com completion is that. Yes, exactly. A and so by extension, every algebraic structure that's based on sets with binary operations satisfying some axioms is a fiber in some appropriate vibration of this space. I agree. But but the fact that it's binary operators is important. This thing, the geometry of this thing will be different if it's not binary operators. No, exactly. So, so which is why I'm actually quite excited to produce the ring version of these. Um, you know, once we start looking at rings and modules and algebras and things, it'll right. get more I mean, so, more so you know, what we got, yes, I agree. Um, so, okay. Anyway, so, just, I, uh, I have to say, I'm, I'm just stunned by how beautiful uh, like the free abelian groups are. In okay, this, let's in this look at the free structure. abelian group. Um, uh, so generators, relations none. E. How much does it matter that the thing is a so group rather than a semi group, by the way? Uh, a little bit. Well, we can we can see that explicitly. Hang on. Make a three D picture. Let me do three steps. It'll get more interesting. Yeah, it's interesting. But now, now just do graph three D of that. Okie dokie. Oh, no, no, no. Just make another picture. Don't don't destroy okay. that one. Just say graph three D of percent. And, what, and then we're going to look at the abelian semigroup. Right, yeah. Oh, my gosh. What the hell is that? What is that? I don't know. Hang on, let me do... I think this might get... I forget which one it was that had some very nice symmetrical structure. I mean, obviously... Oh, obviously no, that's going to be huge. That's going to be huge. Stop, stop, stop. That's <laughs> absolutely huge. We shall see. Okay. Hmm, okay. Give it a moment. <laughs> there we go. That's nice. It's lovely. Yeah, I, I really like this. Uh, There's some nice wall arts to be made here. Okay. So so anyway, but this is the ruleal. This is the completion limit. Well, I mean, yeah, sorry. This isn't. This is just the abelian limit, but. So, um, so to answer your question, if we if we take a so multi semi group, let's do generators, uh, A B. Uh, Quotes right. Relations none. To states graph. So the, so the semi group is kind of boring if we don't have any relations, right? Because it's just each element kind of acts completely independently. Um, but if we start to add, I mean, do you want to take the abelian case? So if we do something like that, then it starts to have more interesting structure. Right. But by, by semi-group, you are doing, you are going both ways because the, the, the natural multi-way system is a semi-semi-group. What? <laughs> the natural multi-way system. What is a semi-semi-group? It's one where the relations don't go both ways round. Well, oh, right. yeah, yeah, okay, sure, sure. No, they, they, they do go both ways around in this. Okay, fine. So your thing is defined to go both ways around. Right, because it's a semi-group. Okay, so the, can we just see the corresponding picture there for multi-way multi group? Just yep. the exact same thing. Just make a copy of that. Just make a copy oh, of yeah, sure. just did. So, but we also need to do E inverses. And multi-way group, multi-way group. Instead oh yeah, group. good catch. <laughs> I 
gives you some indication. Okay. Hmm. Well, of course, uh, abelianization. Did, did you want to see the abelianized version? Because defining a b equals b a doesn't abelianize this, right? Because we also have to. Because there is there's a b and there's x. Yeah, and sure. Y. There's more, more. Yes, right. So we really want the abelianized version. Okay. Well, the abelianized version is just the free abelian group, right? That's just. Let's do states graph structure. That was the thing we were looking at earlier. Oh, Jose on our live stream says he's actually written a paper about the free abelian group. Oh, cool. Cool. Uh, and as an intermediate, we could say multi way monoid. Uh, well, actually, let's let's do the free case first. So this is all going to give me a, a further complex about the NKS book that everything that was in there that was partially explored actually needed to be taken further. Um, okay, so that's the that's the free case of the monoid. But then if we do, well, actually, I, I should have a I should create functions for doing abelianized versions because I don't have that right now. Uh, but that oh, would be useful. Uh, okay, that's not... equals EA uh, B E equals E B. And, and you have E squared equals E already. Oh. Uh, e, well, we could do that as well. Oh, sorry. Ah, no. This is the problem with using symbols. <laughs> yeah, that, that is a problem with using symbols. But, you know, it should have E squared equals E anyway. Yeah, okay. All right, so let's zoom out back back again to what we're talking about. So we're talking about the fact that, um, okay, so we've got this notion of models and we've got the idea that um, by we can make these foliations that, that add equivalences effectively. And your claim is that univalence, the univalence axiom is the statement that uh, we can as well mathematically, I mean, I still claim that the fundamental point of the univalence axiom is mathematics only cares about answers. It doesn't care about working. That that's the fundamental statement. It, it, in other words, you can, once you've established an equivalence, you can throw away all the working inside. Do you agree with that statement? That's, I mean, that's an implication of it. Yeah, I agree. But, but the question is, what's the essence of, I mean, so in physics, it's like saying you can, see, when you say it's an equivalence, what, what you're saying is you can deduce things about the world by, even yeah, if an, you've coarse grained, you can just, still deduce things about the world. Yeah, it's just coarse graining, right? I mean, that, that's the essence of it. It's that once you know the macro state, you can throw away the microstructure. Right, but 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 the fact that you can throw it away, the reason that that is a meaningful statement, the reason that's a contentful statement is yeah, yeah it is because you care about the theorem more than you care about the proof. And no, I, no, I mean, but I, what I'm saying is that you can you can then build your mathematics doing only that. Similarly, you can build your physics looking only at the coarse grained states. No, no I, I agree. Right, but so it is not self evident, and it is a consequence of you know, causal invariance or the, or the, uh, you know, it, the, that for, okay, it, two statements, either there's causal invariance or there are observers who induce causal invariance. And either way, it's sufficient to look at the, the causally modded states to know how to build the physics that you care about. And similarly in the mathematics, what we're saying is it's sufficient to, I mean, operationally, what it means is in doing mathematics, you care about theorems, but you do not care about proofs. To 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 build your mathematics, you can you know once you've proved something, it's like it's like the Tetris game; it's already disappeared, and you can go on and, and build further in the tower. Is that a fair characterization? I mean, that's I'm just trying to get an intuitive understanding of what this means. That's, yeah, no, like I say, I, I, as I think as we talked about last time, I, I agree that's that's an implication. Right, but the the, the question is. That is a, what is it about mathematics? Because the fact that mathematics is doable, right? If it wasn't for that, you know, 
in, in studying cellular automata, I want to contrast the mathematics of studying cellular automata with mathematics as it is normally done. And, you know, I think the- It's the, because the, mathematics builds up lemmas and CAs don't, right? That's, that's what you're saying. That's what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that in CAs, you care about the innards of what happens. It is not sufficient to just say, you know, this is the, the input output pair, so to speak. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think we all agree on that, right? That, that, okay, yeah, okay, but that I think that's a math, math, mathematicians sort of, define lemmas. Yes, I understand. It, it may be obvious, but I think it's a fundamental piece of philosophy of mathematics which had not been understood, at least by me, before now. Okay. Um, the, um, right. Define lemmas and cellular automaton operatives do not, so to speak. Um, yeah. Okay, but but then. What we have been coming to last time was, okay, we had been, we were close to having a good understanding of the analog of special relativity in these things. And um, so let's just recap that. So the analog of special relativity is the statement that uh, there are, well, okay, different frames correspond to different relations being added. Right. So, okay. Well, so, okay. So we're, we're saying that given a, I mean, that, that's a, that's a, okay. Let's, let's, um, I mean, that's the statement. Let's walk through that claim, but we, we can also walk through the claim that different frames correspond to different foliations that correspond to different editions of relations. And we're saying that the basic claim is you, you're claiming that this quantity is invariant with respect to that. That is, you can either verify the theorem by walking down the explicit proof graph as defined. What are we calling this? It's, I mean, it's basically the multi-way graph. But what is the mathematical statement of that? The, the explicit abstract proof graph, basically. Or you can say, let me define a model, verify the model. I'm not sure what the analog of verifying the model is. And in, in, I mean, you know, in, in space time, we don't think there's anything to verify. In the case of an inertial frame, we're just like, it's okay. You know, we can set up an inertial frame. I guess a, that's in Minkowski space, so it's not obvious. The I, I don't, I don't understand frames, it. So, so, well, in GR, it takes irreducible computational effort. Yeah, to to, diff, to to confirm that you have a valid choice of foliation. To determine that the points in your claimed space like hypersurface yeah, are, indeed are in fact with the causal right. partial order. Indeed, so it the, does. Right. But the, the question, okay, so I, I just want to, okay, in general relativity, I understand that you're, that what you're doing there is to trade off the establishment of a valid sequence of spatialized hypersurfaces with the, which is the model val validation uh, against the actual sort of following of the, these, these edges. Um, But let's see, that there are more things that are true. Okay, but what is the analog of special relativity? What is the analog of the Minkowski? Or isn't there one? Or is it only... What's the analog of special relativity? Well, the, the, I mean, the, the statement as reduced to inertial, mono, uh, to, to inertial models, right? And, uh, you know, models with only one additional I, I know, relation. I know, I know. But is, that, but is there a clean version of that? In other words, can we can we quantitative de derive? What is the analog of the quantitative? You know, one minus v squared over c squared. What's the analog of e equals m c squared? Um, well, with e equals m c squared, I, I I don't really understand what you meant by the derivation of it in the space time case, given that it's a definition. But um, 
Well, it's not a definition. It's a definition of rest mass. But the, the, the question, but there is an intuitive sense of a rest mass. Sure. Right. That's the, that's the question is whether there is a definition here that, you know, sort of aligns with the intuitive notion of a rest mass. Right. So, so, I mean, the question is, look, in, in general, I don't even know in, in the, okay, again, special relativity. Is there, a, is there a clean notion of special relativity as opposed to general relativity? Yeah. Okay. So, and your claim is that that is the one relation case. Okay, well, let's see that. I mean, so if that's really right, then it better be true that that one relation. So, what's the analog of velocity? Um, what do you mean? It's, it's, the analog of velocity is the, is the distance in the proof, you know, is given by the distance in the proof space of the two sides of that relation, obviously. Well, it's saying that the two sides of that relation. Let's imagine that we put them in. We put them in two successive elementary time slots. Is that going to be our velocity? That we take the spatial distance in proof? Uh, no, it's not right. It's not quite right. Why not? It's not quite right. Okay, look, proof space. Okay, first question is what's distance in proof space? Okay, distance in proof space. How do we measure distance in proof space? Answer: We have, you know, we have this multi-way graph. Okay, defining points, presumably. Let's, let's, okay, so this isn't quite the same thing. So, okay, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. What? No, 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 no I'm just, I'm, writing, I'm recapping what we discussed last time. Uh, the number of necessary. Well, okay, so this is this is distance from the root is a coordination which is essentially like in the like the time in the cosmological rest time. Right? Right. This is so you should write that down. You should make a note. This is time difference in the cosmological rest time. That that's uh, the difference between two terms. The so the time this distance is between an invariant. Two proof time interval. Which is, there's just to be clear, that this is the distance that you have to go down in the multi-way graph to get from one term to another, right? But what, now what does that have to do with, okay, fine. What, so that's what, the, what, what is, what is it? This isn't a distance, this is a coordinatization. But it's also a distance. It's a coordination if you start it from the Big Bang at the beginning. How does it give how does it give additional coordinates? It's giving one coordinate, right? The number of applications. Uh, you, you're saying that that you that you take a if there was only one axiom, it would just be a, a, a linear order of how many times you had to apply that axiom. Yeah. Okay. So if you have if multiple, multiple axioms, so, then you have so, a high so, dimensional space. Okay, so let, let's walk through that. So that if it's a binary tree, for example, the leaves are labeled by binary numbers. Right, that's the analogous thing. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Do you, you agree? I mean, sure. That that so we have two two theorems that two axioms zero and one, and the each leaf is labeled by the by the sequence of of uh, of of axioms you needed to do to get to that leaf. Yeah, I, I understand. Yeah. 
Okay. What? So, okay. So let's, again, I'm trying to understand what is the derivation? How can we derive? Is there a quantitative version of Lorentz transformation in this case? Well, yeah. Okay. What is it? It's the Lorentz transformation. It's the thing that preserves the, you know, this invariant interval. Okay, well, can we write down what, it, what the formula for it is? So in terms of that proof time distance, right? We have the, the, you know, we have the speed of light, which is the, you know, the maximum proof speed. Yeah. Right? So what is, what is our formula for, you know, can we, can we write down what, I mean, we should it, be able it's to the write Lorentz down. Transform. The, the, you know, the, Okay, but so the Pythagorean, Pythagorean theorem here, holds in Hilbert spaces of any dimension. Yes, I, I understand. But so, can we figure out what it actually means in this case, right? So you you've made a claim that the relation we can describe what the velocity corresponding to a relation is by looking at the distance spanned by that relation, effectively. Sure. Okay. So what you're claiming is, if we look at the distance spanned by that relation and we compare it. How do we compare that to the quote speed of light? I, I don't understand. Look, I mean, there should be, okay. So listen, if we're trying to get, for example, time dilation, which you're claiming you would get by taking successively in, in your model, in your setup, right? As we take modding out relations that take, that span larger distances, what we will be getting is essentially higher velocity frames, right? Yeah. Okay, so it should be the case that as we get to a higher velocity frame, that that the that when we do that, that the essentially proof time necessary goes up by this Pythagorean. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so that will be an interesting thing to see because it is a quantitative relation that we get by saying we are picking a particular relation. That then implies something about the number of steps that we have to go through for a particular proof, right? It's saying- I, I agree, given, which is why in the very first live stream, I mentioned it would be interesting to find out what the model theoretic analogs of slowdown theorems would be. Right, but so let's see what it is. I'm currently working on. Okay, okay, so, so, so this is, so this is, okay. So, so this is not a totally stupid question. It's just, you haven't figured out the answer yet. Is no, that, no, I-, I, I I agree it's not a totally stupid question. That's why we asked it several days ago. I'm, I'm wondering what the... I mean, do you... Because I'm slow and I work on other things in between these live streams. Um, the, uh, but let's, let's go back to this again for a second because I think we're actually, we actually could kind of crack it, right? So, so what we're saying is there is a certain distance. I'm just saying, what is the comparison? There's a certain distance in this metric, right? In your... Okay, you've got a multi-way graph. It, you label every you can label every node in the multiway graph by a possibly redundant sequence of I mean it's essentially the word length in the well it depends how you set it up but but it, it's a in the multiway graph every element can be labeled by its essentially part number in how you got to it right yeah. Right, which is a, in general redundant. There may be multiple paths to it, but there is a shortest such path, right? So you, you could label it if you want to label it with different axioms, or you could ignore the different axioms, and you could just say it's such and such a number of steps from the root, right? Make sense? Right, so, so what we're saying is a, a given, you know, two elements which are joined by a, by a completion, by a relation, right? They will each have certain coordinate positions in that coordination, right? Yeah, right. Okay, so now, now we've got, so we've got two, you know, elements which you are going to conflate with a, with a completion, right? With a relation. Mm -hmm. And they are, they are at two different coordinate positions, right? They're about to be conflated. They will define, in your claim, a frame, right? 
that that corresponds to that has an effective certain effective velocity if those proof relations were okay so here's here's a point if those proof relations were time like if those terms were time like connected right then that would be the equivalent of a speed of light transformation no it would be a superluminal transformation if they were light like connected it would be a super, oh, fine, it would be a, fine what does it mean for, okay so what would it mean for them to be light like connected well i mean that's what i that's what we discussed last time right and that's what i was writing up here um so, you know, here, if you consider an elementary proof cone, you can consider the extremal points just like you would in an ordinary causal network. So then the light-like parts of the non-constructive proofs, the ones which require infinite computational efforts in order to witness the associated model, and the internal ones, the time-like paths. Yeah, yeah, yeah right, that are right. But I'm just trying to, trying to understand. Okay, I still, I just think there is going to be some formula that basically just tells one in terms of the distance between things which are being connected in a relation there will be some quantitative formula that tells one the effective slowdown in proof. Uh -huh. Right? And that formula would essentially tell one, as one looks at a theory, right, as one, as one turns a knob to change one's theory, right, that, that's going to tell one, as you add axioms that effectively connect more and more distant points or more and more, uh, well, closer and closer to time-like connected points, What does that mean intuitively? As you connect those things, I would expect that it would make proofs go faster, but it doesn't. It makes proofs go slower, according to this. What's going on there? In okay. other words, okay, I would have expected that if you make a lemma that lets you jump ahead, for example, in my Boolean algebra thing, right? Yeah, you, yeah which, it, which it obviously does, right? Because you're you're increasing the theorem, you're decreasing the theorem verification complexity by increasing the model verification complexity. That's why I wrote this down. Okay, but, but, but so intuitively, what one's saying is, by adding a lemma, which is a, a jump ahead lemma, you are effectively, why does that, what, what's confusing me is time dilation is normally something where things happen more slowly, right? It takes more steps. Oh, no, I, I see the problem. The problem is the definition of the time coordinate. You, you appear to be going more slowly but time passes more quickly for you. Right, right. That's the, that's what I'm confused about. Right. So the right. so the you're, answer you're, is you're when, decreasing the theorem verification complexity, as I said. Right, right, right. So so what you're doing is so you're by tra making, you're trading off ver you're trading off theorem verification complexity for model verification complexity by because by adding in the lemma, you're reducing the length of the shortest proofs, but you're adding in an extra step in verifying that that additional lemma is in I, fact I, compatible. Yeah, with the I guess. But I mean, so, so intuitively, what you're doing is you're by by adding a sort of jump ahead in the in the theorem network, right? You are making it faster for you to get further in the theorem network. But to somebody looking from the outside, that means time is passing faster for you, but you. Uh, Right, but every but but so what does that mean for what is it? What is the outside observer? What is the observer at rest in the mathematical and metamathematical world? What is the observer at rest as compared to? So the observer at rest is saying is the free model. No, I understand that, but the, the observer at rest says that uh, oh, your time is passing. Why, do, why does the observer at rest say time is passing slower for, oh, I see, I see, I see. Because, because they are able to get further in a given time, that means time is passing slower for them. Yeah, okay, okay, that's right. That's just exactly the same. And, um, but then the claim is there is a quantitative connection between time yeah. All right. Okay. I mean, I, I, I still think there's a, there's some actual, you know, v squared over c squared thing. But do you agree, or do you think that that's not correct? That there's an actual, you can actually measure this, as in, you can actually measure. No, of course. But of course you can. Right. But so, so you should be able to see it. For example, in, in other words, what this should do is, gosh, we might even have the data for this. Uh, in, 
in the NKS book, needless to say, I did this thing of adding lemmas, right? Adding which the, is the, which is the thing I did here. Okay. Okay. So, you, me, so you, know, what, you you can shorten proofs by adding. You, know, you you can you can achieve a speed up of three steps by adding only a single lemma, at the expense of increase you know, of increasing the computational complexity of verifying that the lemma you added was compatible with the original set of axioms. But in particular, this means that that as you add lemmas, so this is kind of like the speed up of mathematics, so to speak. As you add lemmas, the question is, you know, as one publishes more theorems, what does this mean? You know, how should mathematics speed up as more theorems are published? And what? Right. So, so, well, I, so as the you know as the technical sophistication of mathematics increases, aka more theorems are known, right? aka more theorems known, a generalized graduate student who is prepared to take these theorems yeah, on, on faith, faith can, can proceed more quickly. But the task of uh, you know, formalizing all of mathematics gets more complicated. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So then, and and in particular, uh, fair enough. So what else should we? I mean, okay, okay. So, okay. So what's the, What's the story of, of, I mean, if we look at mathematics as it now exists, what is it like in terms of, I mean, like, you know, how close is it to Minkowski space? What, what, um, you know, what is the curvature, you know, what, what is, if we look at mathematics as it exists, which I've tried to do, you know, the 3 million published theorems roughly that are known, what, what can we say about the, the structure of that space? So in other words, we could have started with a most minimal mathematics. We could have started as um, yeah, what what is it what, you know, we could have started with universal algebra or something. And then we're adding how how do we think about yeah, how how do we think about mathematics as it has been? So as as soon as somebody comes up and says, I'm I want to think about groups, they add an axiom about that, which mods down essentially universal algebra, right? Sure. So the question is, what is the analog between, you know, the human choice of adding these random axioms that correspond to group theory and things like that? What has that done to the shape of metamathematical space? Well, it's curved it. Right. You say it like it's totally each, obvious. Yes. Each, addi <laughs> each additional relation is defining a new possible angle for the for you know for, for this um, time like vector and geodesic normal coordinates. So the more of those you add, the more arbitrary curvature you get. Uh, okay. So let's let's Jonathan, you you just okay. you see the problem is you make everything sound so totally obvious. I agree he, that this is the direction, but I think to to the statement that new axiom systems and mathematics correspond to curvature of metamathematical space is not a self-evident statement. I mean, it may be now okay. self-evident, but... Uh, Fair enough. Uh, adds, each relation adds a new um, unit normal direction to a proof-like hypersurface. So what you're saying is that, the, that what this is sculpting the proof-like hypersurfaces. And and your claim is that with just a single relation, if mathematics was universal algebra, well, what that isn't even the base. What is the base? The base of the base. The base of the base is just the language without any any anything, with no relations, no it's the set of all symbols. <laughs> right. So that's the base of the base, which which itself is not well defined, but we won't even worry about that. Right. Okay. So so what you're saying then is that every every time we add you're saying you're sculpting the proof-like hypersurface 
by adding an additional capability for it to be deformed in a new direction. Right, right. So, so, the, so the point is, you know, okay, e each relation is defining an equivalence. Each new relation is defining an equivalence between a pair of proof-like separated points, right? Yep. Um, I, uh, and Wait a minute, should we be calling them proof-like separated? Because they're really the space-like separated points. They're, they're branchially separated points. Yeah, I'm, so I'm calling them proof-like separated because they're proof theoretically independent. That's the, I mean, that's the key thing, right? Uh, I agree, it's not a perfect analogy. Well, let's see if there's a better word. Um, I mean, what would be the deduction is the word that corresponds to time. Deduction corresponds to time. What is orthogonal to deduction? I mean, it's really independent. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's yeah, they are they are proof, proof independent. independent. Okay, but fine. L l let's just say um, a proof pair of independent, proof theoretically independent terms. Um, which defines a hyperplane whose normal um, right, yeah, okay, it, which defines a hyperplane considering its normal gives a unit normal direction yeah. to some hypersurface. I'm not sure this is the best way to think about this. I mean, so so that right. each new relation. Let's see. It's defining. What is the analog of adding new relations in in okay in in ordinary physics, the analog of of. Is the point right? So in in ordinary relativity, um, I want to try to sculpt a space like hypersurface. Yeah, by, but, by doing clock synchronization between distinct points. Right, right. So, 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 yeah, exactly. So I, I have to try, but I, I only have a discrete set of clocks and I have to try to interpolate a hypersurface that's consistent with that. Yeah, exactly. Can you write this down? Because that's a good point. That's a good, I mean, that, that's, okay. that's what's going on here. This is pairwise yeah. clocking, you know, pairwise equal. What, what we're so, doing uh, by adding each relation is a bunch of pairwise uh, synchronized clocks. Uh, space-time foliation while only having access to a discrete set of clocks. In particular, pairwise. Respect, to... Yeah, with respect to which to do uh, pairwise synchronization. Is it a whole... Is it a whole clock or is it a single event? Aren't you doing pairwise synchronization of just events? Uh, yes, yes, you are instant discrete set of, uh, I guess, instant, yeah, discrete set of, a events. set of events. Right. So what we're doing is, but, okay. but cru yeah, cru crucially, there are events with, you know, with, with a time tag. What do you mean? A cosmological rest frame time tag? Yeah. Right. I mean, so, so e e well, no, e each, each event. It's what what you have is not a clock, but rather an instantaneous clock, right? It, it's it's a it's a a space time event, but which which has an which has a well defined time associated with it. Where did it get that time? Well, the same way a clock, same place a clock gets that time. Which is f from where in this in this view of the cosmological rest frame, or what, or just the clock Clocks, evolving from? Clocks from, don't get time from cosmological rest frame. They just get you know they they are intrinsic generators of time tags. But only once you've started the clock. So if the clock pre-existed from the time of the Big Bang, it will have ticked a certain number of times before it reaches you. Right. Right, but a, a, a clock, what is the analog here? This is a clock. What, why do you say that this has a, a um, where, do, where does it need an intrinsic time tag? All it's saying is that these two um, uh, proofially independent events are now considered to be time-like, right? You, you're now, you're defining those two events to be, to be in time-like relation to each other. 
Uh, you're saying that those two events, which you wouldn't have otherwise known that they had any... Wait, what? what? I, 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 I completely don't understand. So I, okay. I, I give you, in ordinary relativity, I give you a discrete set of events that are not time tagged. How do yes. you do synchronization? What does that even mean? I'm saying what you do is you say, you've got these random events in space time, right? Yeah. And I'm saying this event is, you know, I'm going to define this event to be a time-like successor of this other event. On what basis? And why is that synchronization? Well, I think that's what you're ending up doing here. And I think that it's not easy to do that synchronization, which is the point you're making. I mean, in other words, that that's I mean, not easy. If you don't have any, if you don't have clock information, you can't do synchronization. I, or at least I, I'm not aware of any possible procedure by which you could. You you can't synchronize. You can't do a sort of permanent many slice foliation synchronization. You could only do one slice. And I think this isn't correct here. I think that the but analogy that's not, here is... Then that's is, not synchronization. Then, then you're just taking right. a collection of events and saying they lie on a hypersurface. That wasn't what I... That, that's not... Right, but I think the reason is that in this case, as soon as you add a relation, you're not just adding a relation in one place. Yeah, you it, are doing it, it's extrapolated over the whole space. Right, which is, yeah. which is right, which is, which is why... Okay, so in fact, the, this time tag isn't the relevant thing. This thing is more like a clock because what's happening is that it's saying... Um, all pairs of events. It's a little confusing. It's a little confusing because it's it's basically it's defining. I don't an think it's confusing at all. You, you you have a selection. You have a discrete set of events with a time tag, which you can think of as being an instantaneous slice through the time like extension of a collection of clocks. Yeah. Right? And then all you're doing is you're saying we can define a, a synchronization and then let's extrapolate that synchronization, you know, the, the, the hypersurface foliation you get from that synchronization over the entire proof time. I don't quite get this. So try, try this again. Uh, the... Okay. So, so, um, uh, okay. You know, imagine a collection of clocks uh, extended in time. So, wait, wait, so these are. These are time-like curves that, you know, have, have the time-like curves traced out by clocks. Is that correct? Right. Right. Okay. A uh, bunch I, I, of time-like curves traced out by clocks. Fine. And on that time-like curve, the clock is, is chopping, is making ticks on the time-like curve. Right. And take a discrete set of slices through these you know, time like extended paths. Right. Okay. So then what you get are a bunch of instantaneous clocks. In other words, what you obtain is an instantaneous, is a, is a discrete set of events with time tags from the clock. All right, fine. Okay, so that, but this is, this is kind of what I was, you know, look, these time like curves. This allows us to do a discrete version uh, to, 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 cons to well, yeah, to do a discrete approximation to standard relativistic. Right. Okay. So l l let's just let's just clarify what we're talking about. Okay. So we have time-like curves that potentially start at the Big Bang, and on them live clocks. On these time-like curves, they're marked off in certain unit in certain intervals, right? That correspond to the ticks of the clock. Mm -hmm. We are then saying that. The space-like hypersurfaces are those surfaces which, which join identical uh, tick numbers on those time-like uh, curves, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So now the analogy here is, let's carefully go through the analogy here, that every... Okay. The analogy is that every completion every, every yeah every every association of tick number 317 on one time like curve to tick number 317 on another time like curve is like the association of one end of a completion to the other end of a completion yep right so each one of those so then as we add a completion okay so the the, the those two time like curves have tried, they, they define one, I mean, I think you, you may have said this already, there's one vector 
in space-time that joins each one of those things, and that is defining a that is the one piece of the space-like hypersurfaces that is so far known from those two clocks is that single vector, mm -hmm. right? And so you're saying as we add more vectors, there are more embedded vectors that must live inside the space-like hypersurfaces, and in general, given a single vector, we could perfectly well have flat space-like hypersurfaces other than that, you know, that, that, that their direction is defined by that vector. But as soon as we throw down other random vectors, we can no longer have flat space-like hypersurfaces. Right, you get curvature. Although it's a slightly weird way to get curvature because what it's saying is that there is no longer a flat hypersurface consistent with those relations, right? It, those relations force you to have a curved hypersurface. Yeah. Well, wh why is that a weird way to get curvature? It's just like saying, you know, if you have a, some random collection of points in the plane, then it won't generally define a line. They won't generally be curved. No, I, I know. I know. I know. It's just a little. Okay, but fine. So we've got these. We got these. These. Um, these edges. If you wrote a note about this, it would be helpful. But I mean, you know, we got these. These sort of finite vectors in that join these things, and they. Um, Okay. And in fact, we could even do that. I mean, in one of our, in, you know, all we have to do is, um, uh, you know, we actually can draw these things, which you in fact had in one of those previous pictures, you actually had drawn with the, with the graph layout, you had drawn something which effectively corresponded to those. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, that we knew, but yes. Right. Um, they, okay, but okay, so then as we add more mathematical facts, we are sculpting these uh, proof independence, these independence surfaces, mm -hmm. right? So what? So if we were to add, so what does it mean, for example, if we were to add some, uh, um, you know, high, what, what does it mean when we, for example, if we're, so, has there been a black hole added in mathematics? In other words, we're adding curvature by adding uh, axioms. Right. Are there any axioms that have been added which, which force a black hole? Well, the axiom of choice. I thought you were going to say that. Let me yeah. understand why. So, because you're saying... Because they force proofs to be non-constructive in its vicinity. Let me understand that. So you're saying, I mean, that's a very interesting statement. If, if, okay. So the okay. question is. Right. The axiom of choice uh, permits non-constructive proofs. And therefore you claim it is a thing with a, which has light like I'm I'm a little bit confused by that that so the axiom of choice defines vectors that are light like vectors is that the idea well okay so so the the axiom of choice is you know so so interpreted as a basis vector on proof space so crucially it permits non constructive proofs but there are there are examples uh, and in particular uh permits proofs of propositions that would be undecidable by any constructive means, right? Yep. Proofs you, there are things you, theorems you can only prove using the axiom of choice in a non-constructive way and which it would be independent if you only Well, so the, the, the claim would be that that vector defining the axiom of choice right. is uh, a light-like vector. When it permits the existence of um, paths, well, Interpreters of vector on proof space, the axiom of choice uh, permits. It's not. It's not that it's. It's not that it is a light. Well, I mean, it's not that it itself is a light-like vector. It's that it is. Con it produces a collection of paths, where attempting to follow any of those paths necessarily forces you to you know to, to follow a light-like path. The AOC defines a family of necessarily light like paths okay with what why let's think about the geometry of that 
What's the analogy in relativity? Well, an event horizon. Why does that force light like paths? So that's what an event horizon is, right? It's the, it's the place where all paths necessarily become light like. Well, the, the... let me think about that for a second. So, y your claim is it's an event horizon. It, 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 at a conventional event horizon, light cones tip over Indeed. such that uh, to remain at the boundary would require. Yes, that you'd be on a light light curve. I agree with that. Curve. Right. But I mean, otherwise, you just cross the event horizon. I mean, if it's a black hole like event horizon. I mean, any kind of event horizon, you have to be at, you know, you have to, the light light curve is the thing that skims the event horizon. Right, right. So the point is that the, the event horizon is a family of paths that are consistent with the causal partial order, but cannot be followed by any subluminal Server. Yep. Likewise, claim the axiom of choice defines a family of paths light like. Oops, sorry. That are consistent with the causal partial order, e.g., defined by ZFC, or e.g., sorry, e.g., defined by ZF. Right, exactly. Uh, but cannot be followed by any subluminal model by any constructive model corresponding to a computationally bounded observer or corresponding to a computationally bounded mathematician. Okay, let's walk through this for a second. Okay, so by the way, we should add subluminal to our spelling dictionary. Um, the uh, uh, okay. Um, subliminal. That, what's that? Yeah, it's subliminal is the only one we'll get. Um, unfortunately, it's a close word, and it's always it's always annoying in spelling dictionaries to think about the redundancy of these things. Okay, anyway, <laughs> but, but back back to the different topic. Okay, um, okay, let's think about this for a second. defines a family of light like paths. So what does it mean when you add this? So what we're saying is any one of these axioms is adding a, you well, know, it's uh, a- Here's the question, right? So, so, so suppose you wanted to prove a proposition or prove the proposition that two terms, you know, that, that one term on an event horizon implies another term on that event horizon. Yep on the same event horizon, right? Such a proof is necessarily non-constructive. Well, by which we mean that there is no completion that, that, that the only way to do that proof is to follow the underlying, uh, um, I mean, let's just walk through what we mean by that. The only way to do the proof is to following the, follow the underlying multi-way graph. Right, the underlying proof graph. I.e., the theorem can be proved syntactically. Right. By following but, an explicit light like right. path. But there is no model in the multi system, but no model lying in the interior of its Okay, own now hold, hold, hold on one second, because the in intuition behind constructivism is the model, you know, you've got enough model. That you've kind of saturated it to the point where the model really is about something, right? Our models, though, are a little bit more sliding scale, right? In other words, normally in constructivism, you 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 want to have, in other words, you know, you're saying, well, the free group is a model. Well, it's. You see what I'm saying? You, you, yeah, you, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so constructivists care more about these. Wait, uh, you know, about these kinds of structures where you're like, where, where were our examples? You know, the kind of maximally non-free structures, right? That, that those are the things that 
these are sort of the, the ideal well, that's for what that's what this you know like this um uh Kiesler orders and and like the, you know i tried to study these in the nks book how close does an axiom system come to defining that there's only one model that's consistent with it in other words right, to right. what extent so, is it about so. something i don't know what that is oh this so this is about this regards um regarding uh axiom systems that define unique models only up to you know define unique models up to isomorphism so wow, it, okay it, i looked so, for such a theorem 20 25 years ago or something i didn't find it is that a newish so, theorem or is that like old as the hills it, it's quite old so it's a bit like it's very much like the lowenheim skolem theorem in its in its construction right so so, so what 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 morley is essentially saying is if you have uh, if you have a theory that if I, I may get the statement slightly wrong, maybe Matthew can correct me if, if I get it slightly incorrect. But, but basically, what it says is, um, if you have a if you have some theory and it defines um, it defines a model of some infinite cardinality, uh, then the by Morley categoricity, uh, there is only one unique model of any you know any infinite cardinality up to isomorphism. Sorry, say that again. Say that again. What? The... So, so it, it's like I say, you know, a bit like how the Lowenheim Skolem theorem is, is telling you effectively that, that, that finite theories can't control the cardinalities of their infinite models. Right? Remind the, the more... me, remind me, uh, it's uh, without me looking it up in the NKS book what the Lowenheim Skolem theorem is. Sure. So, if you have a theory that's that's made of a finite collection of sentences and yep. it has a cardinality of the, sorry, it has a model of some infinite cardinal, uh, you know, some, some infinite cardinality. Yep. Then it will have a model for all infinite of size of for any infinite cardinality. Okay. In other words, that that, that that if you have a finite collection of sentences, that isn't sufficient to kind of nail down uh, the cardinality of it the uh, of its infinite. I understand, models. right? It splits out just like in the Gödel's theorem. It splits out and has right. an infinite. If you uh, have a finite, of... yeah, collection of sentences with a model of size some infinite cardinality. Yeah. It will have, a, have model. a hierarchy of. Lots of, of, of size for uh, size k for any infinite cardinal. Is that right? Okay. For any infinite cardinal, or just a, an infinite collection of infinite cardinals? I believe it's any infinite cardinal for for the full okay. Lowenheim Skolem case. Again, okay. I'm, I'm I'm relying on our resident logician to jump in and correct me if, if if I get something if I say something stupid. But um, so Morley categoricity uh, again. My my recollection of it is, uh, if you yeah. So it, again, if you have a finite collection of sentences, you know so. It, if you have some some theory, and it defines um, well, okay. Essentially, what it does, I, I forget. I forget the precise technical uh, sort of hypotheses you need, but but essentially, it gives conditions where uh, you can have a theory that defines a, uh, a, a, a sort of some infinite model, and you can prove that 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 this infinite model is unique. I see. Up to isomorphism. In in certain cases, okay, th yep. there exist axiom systems where you can do this. In some cases, right. So so this is why so this was used. In, it, it, this is, it came up in that paper on, on uh, Kiesler orders that you you forwarded to me, right? So so the, this is why kind of uh, why are the real numbers so annoying to work with, and the complex numbers so beautiful. Well, it's essentially yeah. because the real, you know, the, the the real numbers as a dense linear order, you claim have uh, lots of possible models, whereas the complex numbers have a, have a smaller number of models. Right, right. That uh, it is is far from being unique. Whereas the complex numbers are unique up to isomorphism as a closed algebraic field. I see. Of, uh, of characteristic zero, right, 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 uh, as guaranteed by Morley categoricity. But I would like to understand this better because th 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 this is a this is an interesting result, and and it, it I think it does have good you know interesting things to say about what we're doing. But, okay, okay, so hold hold on, but but this is this is asking. Okay, we we're still back to the event horizon and the axiom of choice. Okay. Right, right. I have to say that the number of, I, I bet if we search on the web for axiom of choice and event horizon, I bet the number of hits of those two concepts being in the same place is very small. <laughs> but if it isn't, then somebody's discovered something interesting. 
Um, the real question, if it isn't, what's the probability that Dana Scott is the reason why? There's... Yeah, that's a, no, he doesn't do event horizons. He doesn't do he event horizons? Okay. He doesn't do event horizons. No, no, he's not physics oriented. Otherwise, <laughs> otherwise, if, if, one, if one gets to anything where there's... Um, uh, let's see, accident who, of choice. I'm... Who are the logic meets physics crowd? Um, oh my gosh, there might be something here. Systolic aspects of black hole entropy, somebody writes about. Um, Systolic. Well, that, that's a term in... in um, I've only ever heard that in, in the context of like the, the vascular system. No, 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 no. It's, it's also used in the, in the context of VLSI design. Of, um, uh, it's, it's essentially a causal graph related story. Okay. But I haven't a clue why it would where it would show up in um, uh, um. Okay. Well, anyway, we'll, we'll um. Yeah, I found I found one example from um. Oops. No. 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 It's <laughs> the word choice is appearing with the word axiom, but it is not axiom of choice. Uh, okay. Never mind. <laughs> um. The, oh well. Okay. All right. Um. Okay. Question. Um. Okay, so let, let's go through this again. So, so the claim is that the axiom of choice forces that, okay, by the way, there's a question on our live stream from Allison asking about distinguishing positive and negative curvature. Mm, yes, right. So do, 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 you, do you increase or decrease proof redundancy, basically? Right, Posit positive yes. curvature. Write that down. Positive curvature is, is increases. Decrease. Well, yeah, increases proof redundancy. Proof redundancy. You can bow out lots of different proofs. Whereas, negative curvature. Uh, well, I guess in increases proof diversity. Or no, increases not, theorem diversity. Theorem diversity, but proof proof redundancy, but not. Um, so, so in other words, a theory with positive curvature. Is is one that doesn't where where there are few, it's like the the elephant or something knows a small number right. of of, uh, of e. big facts. The fundamental theorem of algebra is probably a high positive curvature region of metamathematical space. Well, let, but let's let's understand what this means. So, positive curvature means that you are concentrating, you're, you're focusing a lot onto a small number of, you're, you're focusing onto certain, certain theorems basically. Right. But, um, or alternatively, you're saying that the number of equalities that exist, because we're really talking about equalities here, the number of equalities that exist is comparatively small. As right, opposed right. to negative curvature, where well, you make a make a note of that. The 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 um oh yeah no no yeah right. There's a different statement that the number of equalities um that increases in theorem diversity. What increases theorem diversity? You know, i.e. I, number of equalities. Yes, is larger. Number of inequivalent, number of distinct equalities, inequivalent equalities sounds too strange. Yeah, is larger number of number of distinct. Um, but so that that is saying that. Um, so let's talk about that in terms of what that means. So. Okay, so if we add a theorem, if we add an axiom. Um, or lemma, whatever it is that number of distinct equalities. You know, one of the things I had in the NKS book was a list of things people say about theorems. Like that's an interesting theorem, that's a powerful theorem, that's a surprising theorem. What do those mean in this theory? So for example, a surprising theorem I had imagined connects two regions of metamathematical space that are otherwise disconnected. Right. Uh... So surprising theorem conjecture. Well, here uh, I, I, a, I a short path connecting apparently distant points in mathematical space. 
Right here, let me just um, find my, uh, let's see. Um, hold on, just find this. Uh, um, oh, come on. Why didn't I put that in the index? Surprising theorem should have been in the index. Um, um, I've got all the stuff about, uh, let's see. Oh, hold on. I'm, I just want to find, because I've got a nice list of these, these different cases. Let's see whether our search system is not totally terrible. Ah, here we go. Okay, here, I'll put it in the Zoom chat. You can pull it up. Okay. Uh, hold on. Oh, if I can figure out how to do that, what are you doing? No, I, I, I you don't have no, to. No, no, I, 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 didn't want, I didn't want to open the Zoom. I only have one monitor. I didn't want to open the Zoom. Oh, window. okay, okay, okay. <laughs> if you're okay. going to. Yeah, it, it's. Um, it, it does, she doesn't, it doesn't, it, it, the way it works is it, it's some. Um, okay. It, it is <laughs> not recursive. It's, it's some. Um, okay, here we go. So here are some. A difficult theorem, a theorem having a long, having only a long proof, I guess. Right. That's interesting. Um, elegant theorem. Short and somewhat unique. I don't know if that's right. So, I mean, I had a lot of notions about how thing, how connected things would be. A deep theorem. Right. A, a, a geodesic segment that appears at the start of many other geodesic segments. Possibly. And that's Euclid's axioms, I mean, Euclid's elements. What on earth do we learn from that? I mean, remembering that that's only that's only a single connection between theorems. There, that's not the network of all possible proofs. Who knows? Okay. In any case, um, all right. Let's go back to your screen. I, this, this is. Um, I was going to see if I could out obscure you with a an even weirder. What? Uh, wait. Let me see. Do I have this? Oh, yes. Oh, sorry, let's share. Oh, go, go ahead. <laughs> this is the associate, this is the equivalent plot uh, for intermediate theorems in Spinoza's ethics. What? Well, but that, that's from a single proof, right? No, no, no. This is for all. So I, I systematized all part, all the arguments in in um, in Spinoza's Ethics, and proved all of them, and looked at the lemma distribution and proof length distribution in those, and did some analysis on it. Oh, did you post this blog post? Or did this no, post I keep meaning to, but I keep getting distracted by other things. But yes, I, I I will at some point soon. How Spinoza only had that number of things in his in his. Um... Th this is only book three. I did it as an illustrative example, but I, I, I did this particular one because it's the one that has the the you know the the, the money shot, the which is the proof of the necessity, the necessary existence of God, which takes two hundred fourteen right. steps at least in the way that I formalized it. Yeah, well, just wait until we can do this. You know, we're going to get closer as we understand meta mathematics more. We're going to get closer to the proof that the proof of the independence of the existence of the universe. That's going to be exciting. Right, I I'm, I bet that can be done. Um, I agree. The, I think I think we even have a scheme for doing it, but we should, which we keep meaning to discuss. But the, okay, well anyway, I mean I don't know what it means if we can prove the independence of of the existence of the universe. Um. Yeah. Well, anyway. Um. Okay. The 
I mean, hang on. Since we're since we're on it, just as a just as a sort of rough scheme. So this this is how I claim I th I, I think it could work. Why are, you, why are you putting it there in this? In this I, I don't know. I, 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 I think put, you should I think put it at the end under a section <laughs> yeah, okay, called so "Existence of the Universe." Existence Otherwise, of we're going to be totally confused. Uh, <laughs> axiomatic independence of. Uh, okay. Um, so if you say something like, um, okay, so so you you give me an argument of the form. Uh, X implies that the universe exists, right? That that yep. would be a that would be a an explanation. Yep. So, how do I go about verifying whether or not that's true? So, first of all, what I need to do is so it's exactly the, the reason I want to. I think it's useful to discuss actually the, the, this now is because it's exactly this model verification question, right? That so there is a universe out there, and there is the universe referenced in your argument, but how can I confirm, which is a model of the actual universe? How can I confirm that they are isomorphic? Right. Okay, hold on, hold on. Your, your argument tells me that a thing that you have called the universe exists. I think you should say universe with a capital U. Okay. There is a universe, but that, that isn't with a capital U. That's okay, not a sorry, capital yeah. U. It implies that the, the universe exists. There is a universe out there. How do I determine the universe, right? Which is more the actual physical universe. Right. Right. Okay. Yes. So, so basically, yeah. So, 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 um, in other words, validating your argument is a problem of model verification. Confirming that universe equals equals universe. Okay. So now consider the analogy to the second incompleteness theorem. So consider second incompleteness theorem, which says that, um, so consistency of piano arithmetic is independent of piano arithmetic. Yep. And the way you prove that is you say, um, well, to prove consistency of PA would require enumerating all, uh, you know, all, all, all semantically true propositions in PA, or would require so enumerating, sorry, all syntactically provable yep. propositions, propositions in, PA. in PA and demonstrating that there are no contradictions. Yeah. But by first incompleteness theorem. We can't do that. Right. No such enumeration exists. Okay. So I claim that there is an analogous thing here that prevents you that, that essentially prevents you from doing this model validation and so the, so the, we the you know so analog of first incompleteness theorem for physics uh you know uh, you can't know the outcome of of the of the evolution of the universe right right so so you um we can construct a good a physical Gödel sentence by building a physical computer whose program says if you know if, if the rule for the universe halts or something uh, yeah predicts that this program will do x then do y otherwise do x yep okay so but, but intuitively it's just saying that we can't you know figure out the infinite time outcome for the universe Right, right. Um, computational universality prevents us from, uh, you know, fr from computing from something about the universe in a strange pun of words. <laughs> from yeah, from computing features of the universe, infinite time features of the universe, faster than the universe itself evolves. Right. And rough. Okay. okay. So okay, fine. So we've got that. So then. So. 
So my claim is just like validate, just like proving consistency of PA requires enumerating all sy sy syntactically provable propositions, proving that universe equals equals universe requires uh, enumerating yeah. all physical systems entailed by universe and demonstrating that this set is in one-to-one -one correspondence with the set of physical systems in universe. But physical incompleteness. Okay, let's walk through this. Let's tells us that this. no such enumeration can be made. Okay, so the claim is that, uh, scroll back up for a second. Okay. Um, So let's see. I don't know why you need this X implies that the universe exists. I think what you need here is, I, let's walk through what you mean by universe with a lowercase u, universe with a capital U. The universe with a capital U is our particular universe, right? Yes, right. So I mean, my, my point is, what, what would an argument for the existence of the universe look like? Well, ultimately, it would start from some hypotheses, and it would say, therefore, the universe exists. Indeed. So, so any such argument can I claim can be represented in the form X implies that the universe. Okay. So, exists. what we're saying is, is there an axiomatic basis for the statement that the universe exists? That's really the it, make a note right. of because that's what that that's what this means. Is there an is there an axiomatic way? Is there a way from to prove from mathematics that the universe exists? Is there a proof based on formal axiomatic transformations? that the universe must exist. Right, and the answer to this is about to be no, there isn't, there can't. Any such proof would have this, would necessarily have this form. Right, okay, so we've got axioms that purport to prove that the universe exists. So now... Maybe it's, uh, uh, yeah, okay, fine. Imagine those axioms and ask the question, um, so okay, so maybe it's easier, maybe it's less confusing if I don't call it the universe, right? So so you know we, we say something like the, these axioms. Okay, so so ignore this. These axioms imply that a structure called X necessarily exists. Yes. Is I don't think, don't call it X because you just said X implies. Don't call call. No, no, that's why I'm bracketing this off. So it's okay. We'll call it call it U. Say so a, stu a structure called U. Okay, a, co a structure so. called U necessarily exists. Is U isomorphic to the universe, to the physical universe? Right. Okay, and for that you claim you have to enumerate all possible things in the physical universe to verify right. that. Right. So, so what does it mean? So, what, okay, it's back to our extensionality thing, right? So, so the the axiom of extensionality for universes, right, says that you have to verify every every element in the universe, verify that the universes are identical. Right. Two universes are isomorphic if and only if uh, every physical system inside them is identical. Right. Okay. So now, so, assuming that the universe is infinite, assuming that the universe has an infinite time history, you can't ever do this. Sure. If the but universe I had a normal form, I bet you could do this. But not from within the universe. No. But that's, that's then a statement of computational complexity, not a statement of, uh, you know, in the infinite time case, you just can't do it. Well, you, you don't. Need, you know, this is the thing. Why you, this is the nice thing about this Gödel sentence because you don't even need the infinite time limit. This just says as long as you're inside the universe, you cannot construct this. You know, you cannot construct such a computer. Otherwise, it will contradict the. Right. You know. The, so I think what we the the, this what this what this says is, if you think there is an axiomatic proof that the universe exists, that is, it's never going to work. In other words, that the from within the universe you can't, you can never, the statement that the universe exists will always be independent of whatever axiom, axiom system you set up that purports to show that the universe exists. In other words, you, right. you can't give a proof from within the universe 
that an, an, an axiomatic system establishes that the universe exists. Right. So let's just understand what that means. So that means that, I mean, it's, it's hardly surprising that you can't mathematically prove that the universe exists. I mean, right. that is hardly a surprising fact. Mm -hmm. um, but it means that in any system of axiomatic deduction, you know, this question of, of um, uh, you know, if, if I ask, why do electrons exist? Implies in our chemistry, theory, right. what's that? In what sense? Which which aspect of what kind? <laughs> so he had he had this um, famous rebuttal to Anselm's ontological argument that existence is not a valid predicate. Oh yeah, and so this this is proving so this is the physical that version. Yeah, existence is, version. is an undecidable predicate. Right. right. Existence for physical existence is an undecidable predicate. Is a mathematically undecidable predicate. Even though we think we've reduced physics to mathematics. We still can't, I mean, basically what is mildly surprising about this is that, you know, in our effort to make these models, we think we've reduced physics to mathematics, basically. But yet, the question of, of why that physics is instantiated, we can't answer from mathematics. We can answer about the physics, but we can't answer why it's instantiated. Right. Okay, good. Well, that was that's a good little piece of metaphysics there. That's a nice result. Yeah. Okay. But but okay. Um okay, but so so we, we were talking before about axiom of choice and its and its role in event horizons and the question of whether and the you know what the actual landscape of mathematics today looks like. You know, does it look like a galaxy with a big black hole in the middle? What does it look like? What is the, you know, what what areas of positive and negative curvature are there? What is the, so in other words, what, what we're saying is we humans, just like we humans place things in the physical world, we think with free will, but who's to say, mm -hmm. um, you know, that arrange the physical world to have some particular form. So similarly, we're placing things in the metamathematical world that make the metamathematical world have some form. And those things that we place have consequences for metamathematics that we may or may not immediately understand. Mm -hmm. Just like, you know, when we place things in the physical world, they entail their laws of physics that, you know, if, if we decide to, I don't know, uh, you know, if we decide to pull the moon closer to the Earth, there will be, you know, put rocket engines on the moon to move it closer to the Earth. There will be physical consequences to that that we could potentially calculate, so to speak. Um, so similarly here, as we add something in metamathematical space, it, so for example, you're saying, I mean, so what would get us totally tangled up? In mathematics. In other words, is it inevitable? So if, if we think about the future of mathematics and we think about, you know, the addition of essentially uh, landmarks in metamathematical space, what do those landmarks, I mean, what, what can we say about the, about the nature of those landmarks? For example, you know, Am I making any sense? I mean, in, in um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. but uh, sorry, I've I've gotten distracted by the first part of your question. Yeah, um, and I'm now wondering whether there's a relationship between. So you know how in in sort of in in, in philosophy of mathematics there there's this hierarchy of of conceptions like you know constructivism, uh, finitism, ultra finitism, things like that, right? So. Mm -hmm. uh, so they, they, they kind of go progressively from, from weak to strong. Um, and I'm wondering whether, you know, sort of, et cetera, uh, is there a correspondence to the hierarchy of causality conditions in GR? Because so effectively, you know, constructivism is saying that you can't have 
uh, you know, you can't have black holes. So that's making some, that's putting a causality condition about you know future extendability of time like geodesics, effectively. Finitism is then putting additional constraints on curvature. Ultrafinitism is putting even stronger constraints on what, curvature. What does finitism say? So finitism says that you that any infinite it rejects the existence of any infinite mathematical object. Um, Ultrafinitism rejects the existence of mathematical objects that are finite but too big. Okay, but so, so what like, is okay? So these are you're so, saying, so for instance, you know, like actually, you know, ultrafinitism is kind of part, at least partly motivated by physics, right? It's saying that there is a maximal theoretically computable natural number given yeah. the current age and energy density of the universe, and so you know, any sets that have cardinality larger than that cannot have existence okay so so let's look at what that means here so what you're saying that means here yeah uh, and that rejects, rejects beyond un, you know un, yeah unfeasibly large but finite mathematical structures unfeasibly large but physically large in a sense can't be a, a you know right un unfeasibly slash unphysically large Okay, okay, but so, so again, let's walk through this. So, so we're saying that um, you're saying, what are you claiming about finitism? That it would, I mean, infinite mathematical structures. So that why is that not saying that you can't have an infinite time-like curve of some kind. I don't know what that means. I mean, what is an infinite mathematical structure in this in this context? Oh, no. so, so it's, you know, as we were discussing before in these algebraic cases, right, you start with a, you know, if you start with a free group, it's, that's naturally an infinite object. If you mm -hmm. apply enough relations, it becomes a finite object, right? Indeed. If you apply more relations, it becomes a smaller finite object and so on. Yep. So, these are placing conditions on how many it's placing limits on how you know how many constraints you need in order to have a valid model. So it's saying you can't okay. just have an, an arbit you know some some model of arbitrary curvature. There are actually some but by, by the way, yeah, I mean when you have a finite group, that means there's positive curvature. Yeah. Right. Oh. Yeah. Right. So uh, finiteness. Things are converging. Make a note of that because I'm. I mean, this is completely obvious, but I. I wasn't. I wasn't internalizing that. That a, a finite to achieve a, a finite group. Finite know, to achieve a finite GD set convergence. Right. Oh, re so re in other words, require the convergence of distinct GD six in the associated free group. Right. So, so basically, the point is that when you have positive enough curvature, right, then what you're doing is you're 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 finitizing the the meta mathematical universe. You're making the meta mathematical universe. I mean, just like we believe our physical universe might, you know, probably will expand forever and so on, we could perfectly well have a purely finite physical universe, which is what we're saying would happen in these cases where, you know, you, you could have it so that there's essentially enough mass in the metamathematical universe to cause it to be finite. That would right. have to be the claim. There's enough mass. I mean, you could write that down because I mean, basically what we're saying here is that mass, which we, which we said multiple times here, mass slash energy is the equivalent of more mathematical knowledge. So this is saying when there's enough mathematical knowledge, you are forced to have um, essentially a finite, you know, if you think you know enough about relations in mathematics, you will end up with a finite structure. Right. And, and the fact that mathematics is, has infinities in it is a consequence of freedom in mathematics, so to speak. Right. It's so that your curvature condition is too weak. Right. So in other words, in a sense, you know, be careful what you wish for, because, you know, if you, if you prove too much in mathematics, the, your universe will collapse. Right. That's basically what one's saying here is that if or not prove too much, if you assert too much in mathematics, your universe will collapse. Right. Right. We should make a note of that so that we don't forget that that claim. I mean, you know, in other words, that that term, if you add too many axioms. 
well, I guess relations collapse branches is the point you're making. Yes, but uh, otherwise no one has. But also they, they make for the whole space is finite. I mean, the whole of mathematical space then becomes finite. There comes a point at which... With sufficient collapsing. Right, so, so in particular, we know in group theory, right, that that is the point at which a group becomes a finite group. When you add enough relations, you can make it a finite group. Yeah. I don't know whether if you just sort of add group relations at random, I don't know what happens. Do you know? Uh, yeah, I mean, th I, I, so some of these relations I was adding, um, oh, wait, I, I didn't, I don't think I have the notebook open. I sent you some pictures of things which, which were uh, monoids and things where I basically added relations at random. And uh, and yeah, eventually they, bec they become. Yeah, I, I just wonder whether finite. anything else can happen, whether whether the end result, if you just add relations, is that they always eventually become finite or that they may become essentially inconsistent. They may They may get to the point where there's only one, could you, could they become inconsistent? No, the they, 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 worst case is there are so many relations that they've gone, that they've crushed down to essentially one, one distinct word. Right, right. That all words are equivalent. Mm -hmm. Okay, but go, go back to the end there. Sorry, going back to your thing at the end. Um, so, sorry, it's, it's some, um, okay. So the claim is, as you add more axioms, you increase the mass density of the metamathematical universe, which causes you to have more positive curvature, which would one might think before you reach finitism, what you're saying here is you say before you reach finitism, okay, what you would think from the relativity analogy is that as you add mass to the universe before the whole universe essentially collapses, you will at least locally have a bunch of black holes. Sure. Okay, and a, and a black hole in metamathematical space would correspond to somewhere where there is an event horizon, which, I mean, you know, like the classification that we've tried to do of branchial event horizons, Okay, what, what does it look like when you have a, a branchial event horizon? Um, you're saying that you can't cross, you can't make a foliation that crosses that. Hence, you can't make a model. Yeah, okay, that, that I think makes sense. Okay, so... Yeah, so non-constructivism, we claim. It's still that not that the axioms, do, do the axioms inevitably produce an event horizon? Does the, when you throw the axiom of choice into your metamathematical system, does that inevitably produce a, a, um, a, an event horizon? As, I mean, as long as, you, as long as the axiom system you throw it into is sufficiently rich, yes. I think so. Why? Because... What do you mean? Why? I mean, because it will produce proofs that can only be con that can only be written in a non-constructive way. Well, I understand that, but that's just the statement. Well, okay, 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 okay. Well, okay. Well, we managed to cover lots of stuff. We spent a long time here, but but um, uh, and um, um, and was there a direction? I'm I'm sorry that just. Just to, it's kind of like three hours later, what was our actual agenda? Um, what Was there a direction that you were trying to go that wasn't, I mean, I, I thought this was very useful, at least as far as I was concerned. Mm -hmm. I think we're sure. understanding this better and better. Um, I, sorry, I was, I, I was silent because I was trying to think of an easy example. So the, the best example I can think of is um, an, sort of an obviously non-constructive theorem. Yeah. Like, you know, a certain digit occurs infinitely often in the decimal expansion of pi or something. Okay. What's well, an, the, there isn't a non-constructive theorem, it will be a non-constructive proof. That would be a, what do you mean a non-constructive theorem? So, I mean, by that, I mean a theorem where there is no constructive proof. 
So, I mean, there are plenty of examples of theorems which have both constructive and non-constructive proofs. But what sure. you need for an event horizon is a theorem which has only a non-constructive proof, right? Where the only path is a time-like, is, is a light-like path, which would be the, you know, the, the path. All right, but so let's walk through horizon. what that means intuitively. This, this theorem. No, a theor sorry, yeah, maybe I should say a theorem with only a non with only non-constructive proofs. Probably. Probably. I mean, we don't know whether that, that I mean, that, that could have a constructive proof. That that statement How? could have a construct. What? How? <laughs> what? Well, the fact that there, you could you could say the proof that there are an infinite number of primes could only have a non-constructive proof, and it isn't true. There's a perfectly constructive proof of that. I, I I can't say offhand that there's no constructive proof of that statement. Hmm. I think it's likely. I mean, in other words, for twin primes, it could be that there's no constructive proof. Could it be that there's no constructive proof? What is the measure? Okay, fine, okay. fine. Let, let, let's let's go. Let's go overpowered. Okay, okay fine. fine. <laughs> that I'm pretty sure it is non-constructive. But what does it mean? I mean, is it the case that? I wonder if Matthew is still with us. If Matthew is able to unmute himself, he could actually opine on the subject. Um, oh, I, I am with you, but um, I don't think I'm any help in this case. Matthew, you are you are you are playing the perfect logician here. Um, but is there is there a way of thinking about um, in in terms of standard mathematical logic? How does one think about non-constructive proofs? In kind of the the um, traditional treatment of mathematical logic, is there a Um, well, usually people refer to well, the pro. The, the reason I, why I'm not helpful here is because I I uh, I, I I don't, don't use believe intuitionistic logic. Correct. What's that? I, I don't use intuitionistic logic. I don't use constructive logic. You're a dyed in the wool, law of excluded middle, axiom of choice kind of person. And, 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 and this is because my, my undergraduate degree, my bachelor's degree was in physics. So, so I have sort of, sort of a physicist's point of view of logic. By the way, sorry, can I, can I just comment how, how wonderfully paradoxical it is that someone who has essentially dedicated their career to understanding computability of the laws of physics and things is a, is a non-constructive logician? Yes. I don't know why, I just find that very funny. Yes. The, um, what's the relationship between computability and non-constructivism? Is there one? Um, well, th th this is realizability, and uh, you should talk probably to Andre Bauer. Okay. Can you summarize what, what is realizability? Um, you should talk to him, not to me. Okay. The... Okay, can you make a note that realizability is relevant to this? Do you know what it is, Jonathan? Uh, so I, I've read a bit about. I mean, I, I've read a bit about the the Brower hating Kolmogorov interpretation. That you know, the, this intuitionistic interpretation or the the realizability interpretation, where it's, you know you, you you have a constructive mathematical proof, and this additional constraint of realizability allows you to extract more information from it by essentially assuming that the proof is computable. Um, I, yeah, that's that's about the extent of my, my knowledge. I see. I can see why that would be relevant to homotopy type theory and so on, and that that whole program. Right. Realizability slash BHK interpretation. Talk to the Bauer. Yeah. Right. Um, okay. Okay. But but yeah, so, I mean, so at, at least at this kind of hand wavy intuitive level, that that I'd say they're definitely related, right? That, that you know, constructive mathematics is all about proofs that where you can construct a, a you know a computable model that witnesses that proof. Yes. Right. I'm I mean, aware that there's more subtlety to, subtlety to it than that, but that's what is a non-computable model. Well, I mean, you know, a model involving sort of uncountable cardinals and things. Right. 
would be non-computable. But, but I mean, so, okay. So again, with respect to what we're saying here, our, the, the basic claim is that, again, axiom of choice introduces, I'm still a little bit confused about what, you know, in other words, we're building metamathematical space. We're putting things down in metamathematical space. And we're putting down these these equivalence vectors basically in metamathematical space. And what do we what do we do when we put down the equivalence vector for the axiom of choice? What does it what's special about it? Why does it why does it force well, this? So so it's you know, so so obviously we, we, we have you know generalized Einstein equations higher the I, I'm, I'm going to keep. I'm going to continue using this word abstraction. I, I mean, hoping that you know what it means in, in the sense that, you know. Yeah, the, I don't think it's quite the right word, but yeah, the the, the, the higher the level of mathematical knowledge, the, the, the higher, higher the level. Density. Yeah, the higher the level of mathematical knowledge. Fine. Uh, the more the more proof redundancy. That's you know that's what the Einstein equations say. Right. Yes, and intuitively that's because. Wait a minute, the more proof redundancy, because there are more proofs that wind up going to the same point. Right? Right. The higher the level of mathematical knowledge, there's more mathematical knowledge that takes you, there's more different ways to do the same thing. So then the claim would be the axiom of choice is too powerful. It produces so much mathematical knowledge and induces so much proof convergence slash redundancy uh, that, you know, that, that non-constructivism becomes inevitable. Okay, let's walk through that for a second. Okay, so the claim is that the axiom of choice has too high a, it itself represents too powerful a piece of mathematical knowledge Right. In other words, it's too high a piece of, of mathematical mass. Yes. Has too much mathematical mass. Right. Um, so, so, I mean, here's, here's one way I guess you could think about it, right? So, so there's, um, there's a growth rate of mathematical knowledge. That's inexorable as you go down the proof graph. Right. And there's, and, another... and there's a growth rate of constructive proofs. The axiom of choice is powerful enough that it boosts the growth rate of mathematical knowledge, the growth rate of knowledge. Yeah, to be too fast to. So much that the growth rate of non. Sorry, a, a yeah, sorry, the growth rate of constructive proofs cannot catch up. Right, but so what does that mean? So that means by constructive proofs, we mean proofs that have, that are constructed by using models that are more or less saturated models in the sense that they're actually about something. Is that right? Sure. Actually, does Matthew have an opinion about that? Is that a fair characterization? When you talk about constructivism, that there must be degrees of constructivism. Because this whole question about whether it's a model about a definite thing. Go ahead. Well, no, I, I'm just going to say, uh, again, I'm not the person to ask about constructivism. <laughs> okay, fine. Um, no, but is, isn't that right, Jonathan? That, that there isn't, it's not like you're constructive or you're not, isn't there a question of, <sighs> well, no, by constructivist, Explain in our context what it really means to be constructive, construct, constructive for a proof. It Ooh. means that the proof is being done by looking at looking down the sequence of foliations rather than by looking at the partial order. Yep. Okay, but the problem is the sequence of foliations is, you know, you can have you can have more or less totalism, so to speak, in your in your foliation. That is, right, you can right. have... and, and, yeah. I mean, and there is there is a hierarchy of constructivism, as you say. Is there? I don't know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean, like, so, so for instance, um, you know, intuitionism 
I mean, this is just an example that I happen to know a bit well. Is that, so in, in intuitionism um, uh, permits the principle of explosion. The heck is that? Uh, that that's you know if you if you have one contradiction, you have infinitely many. Oh, I see. Okay. Ex falsa sequitur quad libet, I think is its its fancy time fancy term. That's that's the stupid claim that that false implies anything. It's not totally stupid. It's that's kind of stupid. It's I mean that's that's kind of what that's the definition of a contradiction in in classical non constructivist oh, logic. Fair enough. Okay. Um, so wh whereas other non so whereas other constructivist mathematicses do not permit it. That's, I mean, that's one example. So intuitionism is a is a brand of constructivist mathematics, right? But so, so you're saying there is a how constructive you are, you can be more or less constructive, which is what I would expect from this, right? Right, and 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 we actually, you know, this gives us so so we 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 can now with this formalism, yeah, we can we can put a we measure can, on uh, on how constructive something is. hierarchy of constructivism. both in terms of uh, computability and computational complexity theory of, yeah. of, of the associated models. Yeah, right. So, okay, so then that means, okay, so intuitively what's happening with the axiom of choice is it is, it is making it really difficult to um, have foliations yeah yeah I mean it, it's well it's adding you see it's it's not jumping ahead infinitely it's jumping ahead finitely in... Well, it is kind of jumping out. I mean, the, the, the point is that if you were to follow the time-like path on the event horizon, model theoretically, it then would take infinite. you infinite time. Then it's infinite, right. It's but, just but... that the partial order allows you to, come, to traverse it in finite time. So it is kind of allowing you to jump ahead infinitely. But only infinitely, but, but with respect to our models, so how would that show up in our models where we are creating these models by doing completions? That, that would be saying that if we've added those completions, let, let's just walk through that for a second. If we added some of those completions, why would that prevent us? Can, can you, see, you see my question? So the, the creation of those models is a story of adding those completions, right? Yeah. Okay, so why does adding those completions now prevent us so now we've got a completed well, uh, proof graph. Yeah, go ahead. No, because the point is, if you have the axiom of choice, then there is no finite completion, so, you know, completion sequence. So with AOC for each critical pair you force to converge, you get more, i.e. no finite completion. And why are you, why are you saying that? Why well, is because, that true specifically about the axiom of choice? Because of its non-constructed, right? Be, be, because if if there were a finite completion sequence, then you could construct. Okay, so finite, so, you so what you're saying is what you're saying is that i.e. model construction is not is is undecidable is not non-computable. Okay, so you're saying there exist certain kinds of axioms which if you were to add them, and they probably are related to axiom schemas in, in the world of you know, axiomatization. Is sure. that right? That there, that there exist axioms, which if you add them, you can't get a finite set of completions to cover them. Mm -hmm. But is that related to axiom schemas? N not in any direct way that I can see. Why okay, but what, would it be? how would you? Well, what is the characterization? I mean, if I pick a random axiom, okay, you know, the induction axiom of Peano arithmetic, let's say, if I pick a random axiom, how can I tell whether it is going to induce, uh, you know, a, a nest of, of of critical pairs 
or not? Well, that's the problem of determining whether the word problem is decidable, which is difficult. Well, like wait what a minute. Oh, yeah, go ahead. What you're basically asking for is analogous to saying, here's a presentation of a group. Tell me whether or not the word problem is decidable. No, I realize that, but I'm asking, I'm asking, we should be able to classify axioms. Certain axioms do not have this property. They do not induce non-constructivism. Yeah. And they also, in your interpretation, you're saying that the induction of non-constructivism is associated with the, the, in, the production of an infinite collection of branch pairs. I think so. Okay. Did you make a note of that? Because that's, that's, a, that's an interesting claim, right? Oh, yeah. That's that's what I said here, right? Okay. Well, but with AOC in particular, but the claim would be that for any axiom... Yeah, I mean, that... I, we, we're using AOC as the sort of shorthand for any non-constructive axiom. Okay, fair enough. But you're saying for a non-constructive axiom, for an axiom that induces non-constructivism, that it is a generator, it is a non-causal invariant, it is a, it is a thing that produces branch pairs... Mm -hmm. That is, that forces non-causal invariance. That would be a claim. Yeah, I, I, as I say, my, my reason for saying that is that if this weren't true, then you could induce a, a causal invariant model, which right. I think would violate the, the claim that it's... Okay, but so, so the very interesting claim is that if you introduce rules that are not causal invariant, right? If you introduce axioms that are not causal invariant, that they will force non-constructive proofs. Well, it's not, it's not that they're non-causal invariant. It's, it's a step higher than that, right? It's that they can't be made causal invariant. Well, okay, they're not. Could you write a note of that, about, about that, that they're non-completable? Okay. AOC is an example, yeah. is a potential example of a, of a non-completable, non-causal invariant. maximally non-causal invariant. Right. And i.e. not finitely completably so. Right. As I said. Okay, what the heck is no finite completion procedure? What, what causes there to be no finite completion procedure? Well, if there's too much branchiness. Well, I know that. <laughs> but what, what characteristic? I mean, can we write down, okay, can we write down just with A's and B's and C's? Can we write down something, you know, a string substitution system which has, uh, which has no finite completion procedure? I well, you were just saying so. earlier. You, you were just saying earlier, right? That you have examples of groups where there's undecidable word problems. Yes, but what's the relationship between that and? Okay, the the, the question is this: How does Knuth Bendix? What, what what this is saying is, the Knuth Bendix procedure will never terminate, among other things. Right. right? There isn't a completion the, procedure. Right. And your claim is that whenever there's right. a, a if non... There is a, if there is a finite completion procedure... Then the word problem is decidable. Yeah. Knuth Bendix terminates, so word, word problem decidable. So all, I, all I'm saying is the converse, is the contrapositive of that. Right. So in what sense is... So what is the relationship between non decidability of the word problem and, and, and axiom of choice or other so-called non-constructive axioms? Where, where do you see the, the undecidability of the word problem show up in connection with that axiom? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, this is saying that the proof network the non undecidability of the word problem could be thought of as a feature of that proof net. What, what does it mean for the proof network to say that the word problem is undecidable? I think it means, it means there's no upper bound on the length of, you know, even for a bounded size of, of word, there's no upper bound on the length of the path that will reach that 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 word, right? Well, let's think about that. So, so why? Yes. 
But um, this is a slightly different thing, that there's no upper bound. In order to even reach you know, a word of length four or something, there may be no upper bound on how, how far you would have to go to reach a, reach a, um, uh, a word of length four. What is this? What is this claim? What is what? this? The you thing mean, you just wrote down. I'm just th this. I mean, yeah, I know I can read what you said, but what <laughs> what do you mean? So the 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 condition of the causal graph, you know, limits to a finite dimensional manifold, a manifold with with fixed yeah, right. dimension in, in the limit, is some condition on how how much it can bifurcate. Right. If it bifurcates at every step, it, it's it's yes. going to grow to some yes, exponential yes, dimensional yes, thing. Yes. So so the point is. The ability to apply a completion procedure is some is some constraint on the multi on the proof network branchiness, and so given that this is the thing that allows you to say that the Einstein equations are satisfied in the continuum limit, it may be the case that the satisfaction of the generalized Einstein equations uh, for the proof network implies that you necessarily have constructivism, that that you know you can't have so much branchiness that the uh, that the you know kinetics isn't guaranteed to terminate. Well, that's an interesting claim. I'm not sure I'm convinced by that, but if that's the no, case, no, I mean, then this, one can't... this is yeah, this is conjectural. The, I mean, I would think. Well, okay, but the, the the main point here is what this is doing. Look, look, and another way to say it is the following: the undecidability of the word problem is a consequence of the fact that there are unboundedly long paths necessary to verify even comparatively simple words, okay? Which is to say, in terms of our jumping ahead idea, that's to say that there is arbitrarily long reach ahead, so to speak. There's an infinite hierarchy of reach aheads that this axiom can do. See what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I think that's the point. I think that's the, that's the issue. The issue is, is there only a, you know, when you write down, when you try to write down the completions that correspond to a particular axiom, is there only a finite, you know, distance of reach ahead that the thing can do, or is it an infinite reach ahead? Right. So in other words, what that means is the axiom of choice is allowing you essentially to prove um, yeah, is, is, is allowing you, I mean, all we're saying is the same thing. We're saying it allows you to make infinite jumps forward in, you know, it's allowing you to make infinite jumps in the original proof graph. Uh, you know, it's allowing you to make an, an infinite hierarchy of infinite jumps of, well, it's allowing you to make an infinite hierarchy of jumps forward in the original proof graph, which is to say that it is, And that's well. You're saying, and and the, that with respect to the original proof graph, there is no model with the respect to the original proof graph that can reproduce that behavior. Mm -hmm. Although there is a model, if you assume the axiom of choice, you can get a model. Right. Right. It's just from from with from without having the axiom of choice. But so what is the statement about non-constructivism of the axiom of choice normally? You're saying that if you there are theorems that you can prove only non-constructively without the axiom of choice, that you can prove constructively with the axiom of choice. Is that right? That would be the claim. Although you know, usually it's it's not that. The, the, the set of actual non-constructive theorems in this sense is, is quite small, right? Usually it's just the axiom of choice gives you non-constructive proofs of theorems that could be proved in constructive ways. No, what? what? It gives you... Non-constructive proofs of theorems that could otherwise have been proved in constructive ways. You mean not having the axiom of choice gives you that? No. Having the axiom of choice gives you the possibility of producing non-constructive proofs that could otherwise have been proved. In oh, I see, I see, I see, I see, I see, I see. Fair enough. Well, okay. Do we have a? I mean, just uh, you know, so before we wrap up, do we have a roadmap of where we're, what we're trying to? So, I think what we what we've established here is we've got we can essentially measure for. 
four our automated theorem provers as mathematicians, so to speak, we can measure their, so we're, we're emulating, we're recapitulating the history of mathematics by having the automated theorem prover generate lemmas. Right. And its lemmas will induce a certain curvature of, of math, meta mathematical space. Mm -hmm. So in other words, to every, it's like a machine that's laying out masses in the universe. The, um, you know, it will induce a certain, you know, structure to mathematical, meta mathematical space. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, okay, so that's what happens there. So then in the actual, um, so we, we can say in, in, in ordinary mathematics, you know, my, my long time project of curating the 3 million theorems of mathematics, we could imagine a kind of, you know, if we had those, we could imagine their meta mathematical characteristics causing certain things to happen in the structure of GD6 and so on in this meta mathematical space. Mm -hmm. So, and, and so the consequence would be we can essentially, you know, we've effectively geometrized the meta mathematics, which is what we were setting out to do. And then Okay, well, that's very cool. I mean, I think I understand that the, so I think we understand what the analogy is between physics and mathematics then, you know, in a sense, the layout of things in the physical world is analogous to the choice of axioms in the mathematical world. Um, right. And uh, um, I think, um, okay. And so the thing we haven't discussed, you were about to make a point here. What point were you about? To no, make? no, no, I, no. I, no uh, okay. The, um, <clears throat> so the, the, the set, so I think we, I, I, I feel like we have a decent conceptual understanding now of some of this. So the part that I don't, that I don't get, which is probably the part that Xerxes was here for and has been very patient is, is, is as we take this limit of Rulial space, what 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 is the roadmap for what we will learn from that? What, Taking what, what the, do you mean? Well, what I mean by that is, okay, so when we take this limit of going to Rulial space, we the sort of the the we're defining the maximally non-free mathematical structure. Indeed. Right. Indeed. And what on earth does that mean? And then the claim would be, yeah, that, that, that all, all intermediate mathematical structures can be constructed by foliation or by fibration of that. Right, which is to say that that contains, you know, in the Hilbert program kind of way, that contains all the ultimate statements of sort of that contains all the ulti, all the statements of ultimate limiting mathematics but the mathematics that we find interesting might be much freer than that right right and may not be in, you know in the in the case of non constructivism may not be obtainable by any finite completion procedure applied to the rule your multiway system Right, but so that is the limiting, that's the limit of mathematics as, as we put more and more constraints on. So why is the limit? Okay, so the one thing that's sort of interesting is the limit of mathematics as we put more mathematical constraints seems to converge with the limit of physics. I see, so, so the point there is it doesn't matter all the mathematical efforts that we put in, all the efforts to understand the physical universe that we have, both eventually converge to the same thing. Which is, again, the statement, everything is computational. That's in the end what that's all that's really saying. Right. But this is giving a more mathematical structure to that limit point. I mean, it's the limit point of both both the, there's the limit point. Yes, we can see that's the actual limit. There's a limit point. Right. Um, it's a more extreme one. Yes, right. So that, that's the limit point of 
and the significance of that limit point. So if we think about this in an analogy with statistical mechanics, if this is the renormalization group fixed point, the question is, there's a whole relevant and irrelevant operators story associated with what, you know, as you add in, as you, as you consider things which, which basically limit out at the fixed point versus things that are still rattling around. That is saying, I think that's like the vibration story. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Very interesting. Okay. Did this, this, I'm I'm sorry. We we've gone off on this. Okay, I think we we are more or less done with the with this particular <laughs> track. So so now we now we really can do the 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 Rulliol. But but I mean, just any any thoughts on sort of the roadmap of what we will achieve by thinking about the Rulliol fixed point, basically, or mm -hmm. the Rulliol limit. What might we achieve from that? Does maybe Xerxes has an opinion if if we didn't if we didn't just. <laughs> We didn't lose him. Yes. You mean uh, for, for, for mathematics or for physics? What? Either one. Either one. I mean, what, what do we learn from seeing the this limitingly, I mean, you know, in computer science, there's extreme non-determinism that is the rule of graph. Mm -hmm. In mathematics, it's extreme relationism, so to speak. Yeah, what were you going to say? I, so Xerxes can, can expand on this, I'm sure. But you know, for me, the most interesting thing so far about the Rulliol space, both in physics and in mathematics, is the is the fact that it endows everything with with geometry. Right? It's the thing that explains why we have, you know, Hilbert spaces and space times and Riemann, you know, uh, Riemannian manifolds and things in physics, and it explains why we have. It explains why Lie groups have differentiable manifold structure and why you know topological groups have topological space structure and all that kind of stuff. It's right. It's because it's inheriting the spatial structure from the from the real groupoid. And I think yeah, that's so, kind of a that's kind uh, of a big no group. no that's interesting. I mean, so that that is so the analogy in statistical physics would be something like, um, gosh, I think there's an analogy in both statistical physics and in things like conformal field theory and so on. Um, I don't completely know what it is, but 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 because the fixed point has certain properties, you're saying that even when we do not reach the fixed point, we still have you know a bunch of those properties. And and the understanding, which I don't yet have, which maybe you can explain a different time, is why does the structure of the Rulliol space what is this growth index hypothesis or is this a proved fact that the infinity groupoid has this geometrical structure or topological structure. This is Grothen Dieck's hypothesis, but again, Xerxes, please, please chime in. But no, so, so, so that's correct. Uh, that that is Grothen Dieck's hypothesis. But what's uh, what's maybe interesting here is that this uh, this root real multi-way uh, system is giving a very concrete realization of these uh, infinity uh, topos, and in in such a way that uh, in 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 by using this structure one can nicely realize all the all the universal constructions on on this topos that realize physics as well as realize mathematics but maybe it perhaps goes could go a little bit further than what is usually done in the in the program of realizing physics and mathematics because most of the time when people are talking about realizing physics or mathematics they are talking either about observable uh, physics or provable mathematics but in some sense while this rural multi way system is is really uh, a kind of nice uh, let's say calculus of infinity topos it kind of gives us some more insights into what type of physics and mathematics might lie perhaps outside of uh, standard observation or probability in the sense that if you if if you think about all all the uh, if you think about the ruhian multiway system as some sort of cellular automata they themselves realize certain classifications so i would say that a, a section of the rules that that give you physics as you observe in the world would look like automata of class 4 Whereas there might be some type of rules in the in the, in the tower of infinity tower of uh, uh, of, of the uh, of the rule space that might realize a multi-way system that is more like rule thirty. 
and and that might be that might give rise to universes of physics or mathematics that is unlike anything of what we observe here it's still part of the infinity topos but it is giving you some different type of uh, physics and right. mathematics uh, at least not the type that we are used to uh, in terms of right. constructing so, so the, and building right yeah. so the question this is the alien intelligences question this yeah. is the question of is there a slice of the ruleal multiway system that is the slice that you know can we imagine the alien intelligence basically and what what you're saying is this ruleal multiway system encodes everything any alien intelligence could could view the universe to be yeah it has to because the the way we've constructed th this ruleal multiway system is that we have we have really purposely thought of it as something that has not only rules but rules of rules and rules of rules to to up to an infinite tower so in all the in this entire tower there has to be something like a rule 30 at least yeah, one right. key, such case has to exist and and if you if you look at just that section and and look at the multiway fibers coming from that section it has to realize something of an of a alien type quote unquote alien type no no i agree i agree but but so another way to look at this would be you know we can think of languages for describing the world and just like you know, we have universal algebra and so on as a way to in mathematics. Okay, so so let's think about it mathematically. Think, you know, forget the physics case for a second. Just think about it mathematically. You know, we have a sort of a tower of mathematics that lives on top of things like universal algebra. So a question would be, is there an utterly different you know, implications for aliens? Good, good, good topic. Um, <laughs> yeah, right. You mean more general than universal algebra? Yes. Well, right. So, the, the whole point is, is there an alternative? Universal algebra is one language for talking about, um, you know, axiomatic systems. But there could, you know, what the point being made here is there can be completely different. So the question is, what could we imagine that isn't universal algebra? As a, and have mathematicians even invented things that are not things like universal algebra? I mean, when people write down axiomatic systems, are they always so, doing it? In uh, go ahead. Uh, there, there, there is just since you asked if there if there are mathematicians thinking about that, there, there is just one kind of controversial example of this recent uh, uh, recent so-called proof of the ABC conjecture, where uh, 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 Mokizuki tried to come up with what what I think he calls inter-universal algebra. It's claimed to be more general, but currently it's highly controversial. And it's not, uh, if it is true, then it is uh, trying to be a system that generalizes, it goes even more general than universal algebra. I think it's, he calls it inter, inter universal algebra or inter universal Teich Muller theory, something yeah, like inter this. Yeah, inter universal Teich Muller theory. Yeah. In, in in that the, uh, he, he, they, they try to prove many things beyond, beyond even the ABC conjecture. So what is it? So is it is it a? Wow, okay. So it's so, it's, so all, all I can say now. I mean, uh, I mean, there are very few people in the world who understand that. I'm certainly not one of them. <laughs> but but uh, he he, they try to they try to even define uh, the most basic operations of addition, multiplication. They try to do everything even more generally than than what universal algebra could possibly lay down. Okay. But so in the context of the specifics of the AB, things like the ABC conjecture, so, I mean, he hasn't, has he tried to do it in, I mean, this is, I'm looking at some stuff here. I mean, this starts with the, the most basic thing here is an elliptic curve and that's blah, 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 blah with elliptic curves. Um, but my question is, I mean, universal algebra is very, very simple to define. So do, does he have a definition of this that is something, um, is that right? That that what it does? So, yeah. I mean... So so I I don't know the answer to that, and uh, um, I don't know the exact answer to that. But I'm also not sure if the system that he has built up can actually be verified with with the way we use current mathematics. I don't know if the current well, mathematics. Probably, has it's probably a different axiomatic system. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, so, it's, it's so, just like so. Is it the case just to understand the structure of this? I mean, we have set theory. We have you know, univalent foundations. Do they prove the same set of things? Presumably not. No, I don't think so. 
So what's an example of something that can be proved by one but not by the other, which anybody cares about? Because this is the, you know, this is another long running thing of mine is, you know, what's, what's the simplest undecidable Diophantine equation? But alternatively said, given a, um, uh, you know, for any given axiomatic system in mathematics, I mean, it's a little bit weird for me to even say that, but, but I guess, you know, is the, okay, naive question. If, if we make the proof of Fermat's last theorem, for example, which we don't know exactly what the axiomatic system that it depends on is, maybe it's piano arithmetic plus set theory, but who knows? Could we imagine two different competing proofs, one of which is based on univalent foundations and one of which is based on set theory? And could they even come to different conclusions? I mean, could one of them say Fermat's last theorem, well, one of them might say it's provable and one of them might say it's not provable. Isn't that correct? Yeah, I mean, it's hard to see how it would work for FLT, but for, you know, in general, because univalent foundations are, uh, you know, constructive and set theory is non-constructive, it's, it's easy to see how you could construct an example of such a theorem. Do you know if people have them? I mean, so, so but in other words, look, in... I mean, what all we're saying is the aliens have can have completely different, you know. Where, where was our omega example? I thought that was a nice example. Well, this was the omega example for, for finding digits of omega. Oh, the infinite set of, of um, right. there's a particular so that, digit. That's something that is conceivably provable in set theory, but is not conceivably provable in any constructive system. Yes. By the way, I mean, sorry, Greg Chaitin has often talked about weighing axioms, as in, what is the, you know, in, in the context of algorithmic information theory, there is a notion of weighing axioms, which I don't think is quite the same as what we're describing here. Yeah, we have, that's right, the, the, that's the difference. In his weighing axioms, it is basically, there are no consequences to the axioms in, in his way of thinking about it in some sense. Anyway, never mind. I, I, I get that. But but um but but back to this. So so we're saying that there could be a completely different axiomatic system that might or might not look like our existing mathematics. I mean, we could pick an axiomatic system. I mean, just like I've just enumerated, you know, I spent effort enumerating random axiomatic systems. So what is the difference between my I mean, why has this um, uh, uh, Shinichi person, I mean, the claim would but, have but, to be, go ahead. By the way, do you, do you mind if I just give a quick summary of kind of what the, what the basic idea of IE tech is? Please. So, so, the, yeah. um, so the, the, the essential, you know, so, so the, the ABC conjecture, you know, the, the reason it's interesting is it, you know, it, it gives a non-trivial connection between addition and multiplication. Right. That's kind of that's that's why it's interesting. I mean, it's it's the conjecture that that a that there exist. Remind me what the actual thing is. That if you take the say. radical of a times b times c and you raise yeah. it to the power of one plus epsilon, that it, it's it's a it's a constraint on numbers of prime factors for uh, for for um, for sets of a b c that satisfy the equation a plus b for, for sets of integers a, a a b and c that satisfy a plus b equals c. But anyway, the, the, the point is you, you start from an additive equation, a plus b equals c, and you derive a condition on a multiplicative relationship, like the radical of a times b times okay. c. Yep. So it's giving you some relationship between addition and multiplication. So what IUTEC does, the idea is, uh, you, so you can define, so, uh, so, so suppose you have a, a, you know, a number field equipped with an elliptic curve, which you can think of as being a, a universe, a, a, a mathematical universe. Mm -hmm. Now deform the ring structure, uh, specifically deform the multiplication operation for this ring structure to obtain a different, to, to obtain a deformed universe. Okay. And then IUTech gives you a way of computing gives you an explicit algorithm actually for computing the resultant effect on the addition operation. That's 
the basic idea using links between universes or between Hodge theaters. The heck is a Hodge theater? As they're called. Well, this is part of the question uh, within universes. You know, the thing that makes me feel good about this is, is, is this, for me, this kind of, you know, infinity groupoid level mathematics has always seemed rather out of reach. <laughs> I think it, it's, I, I'm now, it, you know, it, it's a certain... But, sorry, the, the reason why I bring this up is because I, I think, I, you know, IU Tech is, is something that is kind of eminently relevant to, to the sort of stuff we're discussing here, right? Because it's basically saying, you know, you, you have a mathematical universe, you define an arithmetic on it. Now you do you, you very explicitly perform a deformation as you would do in ordinary you know type Muller theory, mm -hmm. um, which we can think of as being you know a, a geometrical def deformation, some kind of like you know, quasi conformal uh, diffeomorphism or something, mm -hmm. um, and it affects one of the operations in this in, in, you know in this algebra. What is the effect that it has on the other operations in the algebra? Um, yes, which I think is a you know w when you start thinking about transformations between foliations of you know, mathematical spaces and things that that's that doesn't seem entirely irrelevant. Um, so well, for, for us, it is like taking a deformation in rural space, uh, right. maybe even a, a kind of deformation uh, by one of the infinity groups sitting there, and then looking at a new multiway system from that resulting uh, the, the the new new fibers coming from that resulting deformation of rules. Right. Yes. Oops. Parameterization of the effect of deformations, continuous deformations on real space. One possible. But it's kind of crazy. And <laughs> who, even, who, who knows if IU Tech is even right? Right. Somebody is suggesting we invite Greg Chaitin. Yes, I, I want Greg to come. He keeps on saying that with his two young children, which uh, who are remarkably young compared to him, he's his uh, he has a computationally irreducible uh, issue of of time slots and things. Um, the uh, um, but uh, um, actually he offered me an, a, a speculation because I gave him a, a like a few word summary of what we were doing. And I'm actually going to look at what he said about, because he said something kind of interesting, which he was assuming we were doing, which I think is not what we think we're doing, but it might be what we're actually doing. Um, uh, okay, he's guessing it's a space of possible mathematical theories plus distance metric between theories. Do we have a distance metric between theories? If, if we look at the geometrization of the topos, then one could get a distance between theories. Yeah. Right. Each theory is a Rulliol fiber. Yeah. In, 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 in some sense, what, what we are sort of trying to do is there, there is this, uh, the, the, because this kind of links to the, what we spoke about the other day related to the curry Howard correspondence, there is actually a slight generalization of that already, which is called the curry Howard lambert correspondence in which they link proofs, programs and categories. But what we are doing here is actually generalizing that one level further by, by linking proofs, programs and infinity topoi and using using these uh, these tower of uh, uh, homotopies and infinity groupoids to generalize the curry howard lambic so in, in in that sense in this in this way of thinking uh, this the the real uh, uh, vibration gives us uh, s sits where uh, in sits in the block where the infinity topos sit and and from that you, you sh we should be able to get all the possible calculus uh, types of calculus that people do in the standard curry howard so the lambda calculus would be one realization as a cartesian category the Z, uh, zz calculus could be another realization as, as a monoidal category in uh, in a categorical quantum mechanics and more generally the homotopy algebras would be uh, realizations of of uh, of uh, calculi that sit in the infinity topos coming or induced from uh, induced from uh, the the uh, these homotopies through the real space so in in that sense we are generalizing mathematics uh, by in fact uh, giving a generalization of a very concrete generalization of this uh, correspondence 
uh, and and a presentation of this as a rural multiway system. That's very interesting. I mean, okay, well, well, I mean, but but so just so I understand that the the sort of status of all these things, the growth and deep hypothesis of the connection between infinity groupoid and and topology is is still just a hypothesis. Is that true? Well, I, I was gonna. I, so this was something I was gonna mention earlier. So, in the context of homotopy type theory, Grothendieck's hypothesis is taken as a definition, right? Essentially, that we use this as a way of defining what topology is. So, yeah, I mean, you can claim it's a bit like the Church Turing thesis, right? You can claim it's a hypothesis, but you can also claim it's a definition. And in the I see. Yeah, so, I, so, in other words, this is this is a, an outrageous, you know, like the statement, you know, you can define the number one as the, you know, the the cardinality of the set of all sets that are not members of themselves or whatever. This is a, you know, you can define basic topology in terms of this weird infinity, the properties of this weird infinity groupoid. Is right, that right? Right. Um, growth and Deke's hypothesis has a definition of topology. Topological spaces are infinity groupoids. Right. <laughs> groupoids. Group owls. Yeah. Oh, I'm glad we've got the spelling spelling system to know about groupoids now. Um. Ooh, do we have? Oh no. No way. <laughs> um. I'll send it in. <laughs> Yeah, we. I'm. I'm a little disappointed that uh, we don't haven't had a packet update that causes Ruliel to get updated as as being um, uh, spelling okay. All right, listen. I I should go. We've we've um uh we've come far in um in the weird world of metamathematics. Um, and uh, yeah, and let's see. We had a few comments on our live stream which you haven't completely gone through here. Um. Is it certain that you can't go faster than non-constructivist in proof space? That's a good question. Not if you want to maintain consistency with the proof network. Well, non-constructivism <clears throat> is just a statement that you're not constructive. The question of whether there are hierarchies of non-constructivism <laughs> is a different question. Um, but, but going faster than non-constructivism would be going fast, you know, be tipping beyond the light-like path. Sure. Well, I mean, so, that, that, yeah, so at right. that point, you're, you're you're contradicting the partial order. All right. Well, um, I think we should wrap up here. Um, so, well, thanks very much. Thanks to people on the live stream, and um, we'll see you another time.